We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mantry and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. I, I, I think there's a possibility of disruption this week. Uh, Tom's been preparing before the podcast began. Not for the podcast, but for other Florida type I guess things. all of Florida can blame me because I had to be a smart person uh-huh. and say, once it gets cold, we don't have to worry about weather. Anymore. Oh, I see. It has been the wettest mm. winter like Florida is, I grew up in California. Yep. Cold, wet winters, warm, dry summers. Okay. That's Mediterranean, normal person climate, as far as I'm concerned. That's what <laughs> I grew up with. That's what I expect, and that's not what I get here. No. Here it is warm, hot. Sorry, yeah, very hot, wet summers. Yes. Rains every day. Yeah. Usually in the afternoons, and when the humidity gets so high that the the sky just gives That's up right, yeah. Yeah. and drops some rain, atmosphere just says sorry, can't hold anymore. In fact, I have to let some go. That's right. And when I was in New Orleans, I remember we could you could count on the rain. What is that over there? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can count on the rain. Like it, it's five o'clock. Yep, it's gonna rain. Yeah, if it's raining and you look up, you're like, oh, yep, five o'clock, it's going to rain. <laughs> like right on your way home from work, every single day it would rain. Um, and then. Cool, not cold, cool, dry winters okay. is what you get here in Florida. Mm. It has been very wet. Ah. And uh, <clears throat> my neighbors are, uh, and I don't use this term lightly, I think they're all suffering from PTSD for the most part. And it's because we've had, in the last couple of years, some very major floods. Yeah, and yeah. Adelia came through yeah. and just flooded like half of the houses, if not sure. more. yeah. In our neighborhood, I think that is the traumatic. Last figure, That's completely the last legit. Figure, yeah, the last figure I saw was reported flooding, like was over just over fifty percent, like fifty four percent of the homes in this area reported some flooding during Adelia, which means that there's more that pe- weren't that weren't bad enough. Like my parents didn't right, report sure. their flooding because they don't have insurance anyway. So it doesn't <laughs> do them any good. Yeah. Um, they're quote unquote self insured, insured, and it wasn't that bad. They just mopped up the water and went on okay. with their lives. So um, if we didn't have carpet, we probably would have mopped up the uh, water right, and gone yeah. on with our lives. Mm-hmm. But we had carpet, and then everything in our garage got ruined, yeah. which my parents do not have a garage. So that's another reason why they didn't have to deal with all that. So there have, there's have been that storm, and there was a no-name storm that came through a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. I guess. No, it wasn't even that long ago, which, again was pretty bad it wasn't Mm. nearly as bad as adelia or ada which was the storm that flooded everybody last year or the year before um and now there's another storm coming (laughs) through and it's all it's all related to high tides and how high the tide will be okay so um there's high there's a there's very high tide this week there's a big storm coming through right during high tide Mm. and people are worried about today Mm -hmm. and they're already talking about friday being another day that we have to worry about Wonderful. So I'm, but okay, and I'm I'm not saying that people shouldn't be worried in this neighborhood. I'm not saying that. Yeah, I am saying that we've had water this high often in this sure. neighborhood. This is not the where we're, the, the 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 levels we're talking about are not that bad compared to you know uh, uh, what we're normally used to during like summers. Okay, but. Uh, People are freaking out. Mm. Like, people are freaking out. And the city has decided that they're tired of all the complaints. Mm. So they've had, they've had like, crews delivering sandbags okay. all over the place, which I think just heightens the anxiety because they see the crews running through, giving people sandbags, and then also making at least a show of trying to clean all the drains, even though I really... <laughs> I don't think that really does anything, but they're, you know, because high tide doesn't care. <laughs> There's, you know, it's, it, 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 the drain can be as clear as it wants to be. There's no place for the water to go. There's no place for the I water see, to right, go. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's a, it's a, it's a good show by the city, but I think that's freaking people out even more. So yeah. I've got, you know, the neighborhood association is just the Facebook page, which is toxic to begin with, <laughs> is just, a buzz I with see. this insanity. So 
I spent the morning, and of course, because my family loves me, and yes, I am blaming them directly. Uh, all la- all yesterday, we we're talking about how we need to sandbag mm-hmm. the garage, and then before the flood comes in, which is going to be about one to three o'clock today. Oh boy! Um, it hasn't started raining yet. Okay. It may start raining during this podcast. Yeah, very well might. It is blowing out there. It's yeah. not that bad, but I mean, it's Florida, Florida blowing, so we're used to that. But uh, all yesterday and the day before, we're talking about we need to sandbag the garage and sandbag the garage, and then every my wife went to work and everybody went to school, and I'm sitting here going, "Wait a second, who's going to sandbag the garage?" Mm. <laughs> like, so Tom was bitter. Tom was bitter. <laughs> got up at eight eight thirty this morning to go sandbag the garage before it started raining right. all by himself. And it's not just putting sandbags that you got to get plastic up. And you know what's fun to do by yourself? Try to get plastic to stay up while you're trying to put sandbags on it across an entire garage. Mm-hmm. It is two-car garage. It was not easy. I'll tell you that. Anyway, so oh let's all let's all let's all cry for Tom <laughs> and his and how and how uh abused he is. It's really oh my God, I, I can't believe the first world problems I have to deal with over here. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Yes, that's, it, yeah, I mean I guess that's that's not. I wouldn't classify that as first world problem. That's just that's just a potential problem. That's. Uh, oh, there's a whole bunch of people in this town who are like, I see. Well, it's, your, "It's your fault for living there." I'm like, "Listen, <laughs> when I when I moved into this house, it had never been flooded, right?" And like for the first five years, I didn't see high water to begin yeah. with, and people all around me were like, "Oh yeah, it, it flooded way back in '54." Uh-huh. I was like, "Okay," so yeah, I had no idea how bad it could be until it was far oh away. dear well yeah we did all that so that people know that that's in the background and if somehow this yes. ends up being like a weird or short or truncated or whatever episode <laughs> then the explanation is out of the way at the beginning uh um, internet went down at my house yesterday while i was ooh. at work because i got a bunch of announcements for yeah. everybody's like why is the internet down in the area and everybody's like i don't know there's no wind there's no nothing oh, but the geez. internet was down so it could could lose internet too <laughs> <laughs> that's all we need <laughs> so if I suddenly disappear from the podcast, just know God did not want me to be right. here if you believe in such a creature. Well, we had a, a little bit of snow in my area, but uh, oh, look at you go! It uh, it went away more or less within the day. It was it was a wet snow because we were at like three or four degrees Celsius, so it wasn't really cold enough to stick around. Uh, we had all sorts of warnings that we were going to have a big you know snowstorm coming in, and parts of BC got hit a lot harder than the Lower Mainland because sure. we're always the most mild in the Lower Mainland down here. Uh, but yeah. Had a, had a little bit of that. Uh, I had a terrific sleep because when it gets really cold and it was windy outside and it's like dry and cold and and everything's just cleared away, then that's when I sleep the best. So that that was all right. <laughs> You've survived. I've made it just fine. That's right. Good for you. So. All right. What did we watch? Indeed. Rob? Yeah. Watch? So I uh, didn't watch a ton. I uh, didn't actually take in any movies this week, but I did uh, manage to get through the entire second season of What If? That's uh, Marvel's What If on uh, Disney Plus, which is the animated series. Uh, taking place in the MCU, and since everything is multiversal now, it's not exactly uh, anything different unto itself, Um, but carrying on very much from season one, it brings back many of the alternate version characters that we met in season one of What If, uh, which... Season one turned out to be a little bit more serialized than first expected because when it was announced, we were sort of expecting that it would be very individually episodic, nothing tying together in particular. That was sort of what was expected because many of the comic books, the what if comic books don't really tie into anything else. They they really are what if you just you what if this scenario and it's completely by itself. Uh, But season one of what if uh, ended up sort of um, combining several of the stories together and becoming a bit serialized. Season two seemed to do a half and half. Um, the first five episodes are, I, I couldn't really see in what way they tied into the final uh, episodes of the season, except that, um, I mean, I guess one or two of the characters, like, uh, there's already the alternate version of them in their own episode, and then it's like an alternate version of that alternate version that showed up in the like the final four episodes really do kind of fit together as a serialized story so um if you are only interested in the part of the story that ties all together you could basically start at episode six and just watch six seven eight and nine because that's the Mm. the serialized portion of this season um i've seen some 
almost complaint stuff. I mean, of course, you're going to see complaint stuff online, but uh, just that, yeah. Um, Captain Carter, the 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 alternate version where Peggy yes. Carter became Captain America uh, or Captain Britain uh, instead of uh, Steve Rogers, is very very prominent and and very much the main character of the serialized portion uh, of this season. So uh, if you aren't crazy about it being a whole bunch of Peggy Carter uh, as Captain Britain, that um, actually makes a lot of sense considering Captain America is like the main. Well, yeah person in the regular universe so it makes sense that C- captain carter would be but the main person in the for, other one. for my own taste i had a little bit of a criticism of this season and this this is just me uh but it was just uh, i sort of felt like a none of the what if scenarios um were really far afield at all they were very minimal in, in terms of like they told the exact same outcomes and the exact same realizations and the exact same stories that we've already seen in the MCU movies and TV shows, but just with a different character in place of the character that did it in the movie or the TV show. And I was like, Mm. that's not, it wasn't super creative. It was kind of like, we just swapped this character for this character. And like, maybe we changed the timeline a little bit, but everybody came to the exact same realizations and outcomes that they did in the versions that we've already seen. So I was like, okay, that's, that's not really utilizing the power of what if (laughs) that that could be. And then it seems as though, you know, in in writing this season, it's like they were, I, I don't know if they actually were, but it felt like they were desperate to get back to the original cast of the Avengers <laughs> because it really, uh, other than they introduced a, a completely brand new character that we've never seen anywhere else. In fact, I don't think she's even a comic book character. I, I think she's an entirely new creation uh, for this animated what if in the MCU. Um, and she was mildly interesting except that they basically just did the thing of giving her every power um which it didn't it she didn't start out that way she started out like you know coming in contact with the tesseract and having super speed and uh uh what do you call it when you can move things with your mind um telekinesis telekinesis. that seemed like how it started but by the end of it she just had every power um (laughs) so that that's that's so boring that uh, that always is a little bit boring uh when, when they just can magically do everything all of a sudden um but yeah, other than interest- introducing that one completely brand new character, it was very much focused on like the original cast Avengers. Mm. They didn't bring in any of the new young Avengers characters or anything like that. So all of it just kind of felt um, more contained. That like if you're gonna do what if, like let's let's go nuts. <laughs> I want to go nuts. Well, with the what whole if. what if. <laughs> I mean, you, we've seen like what if, what if Deadpool kills the Marvel right. universe. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. I mean that's you know what if what if zombies and they did the zombie. They did one, the zombie, but. Thing, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, they're, they're supposed to be, like, completely, like, yeah. I, I mean, you can make the argument, I know that it's not true, but you can make the argument that the whole, like, Watchmen was, like, a what if, because they wouldn't allow, Somewhat, yeah. um, they wouldn't allow him to use the Justice League, That's which right. is what he really wanted to use, <laughs> yeah. so he, they, he, what if, you know, and yeah. there's direct parallels between all the characters, and that's sort of what it's supposed to be, you're yeah. like, this is what I would like to do with these characters, but I can't do it. Yeah. You know, like, what if Spider-Man just killed people like crazy? Sure, sure, you know, sure. Of, And I mean, what, what if it Spider-Man seems like, was more like Robert Kirkman yeah. wanted to use the Watchmen, but they wouldn't let him do that, so he just created Invincible and had, like, um, mm-hmm. you know, characters that, that parallel all of the Watchmen characters, but uh, but in the Invincible universe instead. So, that, uh, yeah, it's been done multiple times uh, in, in yeah. various ways. But, yeah, this it all just felt... Um, uh, much more conservative and uh, held back, restrained than I might have expected. Um, so yeah, that that was my take on what if season two. Can't say I was over the moon about it. There were there were entertaining enough. But one of the other things was like there were a lot of. Uh, I mean, these are only half-hour episodes. Uh, sure. Fairly, fairly elongated, protracted action scenes, uh, which were well enough done, but. It, it was kind of like, I mean, it was it was action for action's sake. There wasn't a lot yeah. of storytelling within the action. I'm like, you've only got a half hour episode. <laughs> it's like, you're not... You need to make it all count. Yeah, yeah, you're not doing a whole lot of storytelling. It was, yeah, so, yeah, I can't say I was super crazy about it, but uh, but there you go. Mm, if if you enjoyed bad. the first season, I would I would say this is a tick down, but it does continue the story. And uh, and the Watcher is is a fun and interesting character to uh, to go along with for, for moments here and there, so... Right. There it is. Maybe they'll do better next season. I don't think yeah. it costs them that much money to do this stuff. Um, <laughs> I am looking forward to uh, 
Echo, mostly That's, because yeah. I believe it scares me that they're dropping it all at once. A little bit. That usually, and it's only it five usually episodes. means that they're like, oh, it's kind of crap. So let's just go ahead and put it all out there. Um, that kind of concerns me. <laughs> it also mean it all. It could also mean that it's a little slow to to on the up. Mm. You know, there's a there's a lot of world building at the beginning. Possibly, yeah. Because uh, a, a lot of times, though, if the first episode isn't showing, mm. isn't getting to the action enough, yeah, 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 they'll drop two episodes at once in order to get you there because sure. the first one is kind of a world building thing. Or like Andor, um, where they put out the three first episodes because it was yes. all a little bit slow. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. But that doesn't mean it's going to be bad. The reason Absolutely I'm excited not. about it is because I feel like, just like Guardians of the Galaxy, when you have uh, uh, an IP that is not as well known, mm-hmm. you know, uh, they are more free to do things that are unique and interesting and edgy uh, and take risks that they wouldn't necessarily take with right. a character like Thor or Captain America or something like that. Um, so I, that's why I'm a little excited for it. I'm mm-hmm. hoping that it's going to be good. I don't know, but I think by now it's out. It might be out, isn't it? Uh, by now? the time everyone is hearing this, yeah, it, it's supposed to drop today as we're recording this. I don't think right. it's out literally as we're recording this, but but today yeah. as we're recording it, it'll all be out. And I mean, yeah, I mean Vincent D'Onofrio coming back. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that's he. That's going to be good as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> He's <laughs> never not like... excellent. <laughs> this is true, man. I mean that that guy. I've seen him like from. If you if you see uh, the Sultan Sea, where he's like this meth, ah, like emaciated meth right. guy. I mean, he's not emaciated, but he's he's compared to what he is now. Sure. He is very very small, and I've seen him in all sorts of roles from and now he's on the he's the kingpin, and you're just like, yep, he can just do it all. And I'm not convinced that he's just not big for the kingpin, and that <laughs> after he's done playing this character, and he's actually and he's just gonna lose a bunch of weight, and we're gonna be like, right. wait, you weren't just like. Getting old, getting fat, like most people are. You just did that on purpose. I am not convinced that he's not doing that. Um, okay, so I haven't obviously watched that much. I am still, uh, I'm still cornering off the home theater until we get all the speakers right. set up and everything. We're still at three point two. You still got all the things that have piled up in this meantime that you've wanted to watch that you're holding off until you got. I'm the, still holding the off on theater it. Ready and, to and go. We're gonna. It's just going to be brutal when I finally realize that I've got to watch like, uh, you know, 170 hours of TV yeah. to get to catch back up. There's a up lot you got to catch up on at this point. It's going to be brutal. I'm going to have to like take some time off of work yep. just to do it. But I did uh, the, I did hear about Tacoma FD, okay. which is a, it's like a, okay, so if, Brook, is Broken Lizard the group, the comedy group that did um, Super Troopers? Super Troopers, yeah. right? So if you are a fan of those guys, okay. some of them and almost all of them show up in the first season. Uh, they are the stars creators of Tacoma FD. Okay. So it's Tacoma FD. FD is the fire department. Yeah. Tacoma is, of course, Tacoma, Washington. Yeah. Um, and it is kind of a Brooklyn Nine-Nine ish sort of ripoff thing if you want to call it that i don't call it a ripoff but it's a comedy in that thing. comedy vein okay yes yeah. i was told by the person who suggested to me that it, it was better than brooklyn 99 mm. and i have watched almost the entire first season mm-hmm. and they are incorrect it is definitely <laughs> not better than brooklyn 99 <laughs> not even close maybe it gets really good it could but it ain't there yet and also brooklyn 99 uh, was really really good so that's a high really, bar to pass that's a hard it's, bar it's to, not to, like to, we're saying brooklyn 99 was oh it was whatever i kind of liked it and this one isn't even as good as that it's like no brooklyn 99 was really really good so yes yeah so a lot more uh crass humor oh, in okay. this and if you're okay. if you're into if, if you you know, remember super troopers it was it was not sure, exactly yeah. <laughs> wasn't exactly it's for the cable audience highbrow. not the uh not the <laughs> network broadcast network audience and, i got you and i started watching with my 14 year old son and by like episode four i'm like i don't know if this is appropriate uh, for you <laughs> so, like, there's a lot of penis jokes in this I thing see. Okay. so uh well i mean the main character one of the main characters names is panisi and oh, it yeah. literally is penis with an eye at the end so, right, I yes, mean, that yes. is his last name <laughs> and i'm like oh god where is this going uh it's nowhere near brooklyn 99 okay. honest with you. but it is if you're looking for a light comedy that's got a lot of crass humor in it mm-hmm. you know maybe it gets better there's four seasons sure. 
And I'm almost through the first season. And I th- is it? It might be Canadian because it feels Canadian. It's only like ten episodes per season, uh... and that feels kind of Canadian to me. <laughs> you know, I don't know. That isn't that how you guys do things over there. I don't think we can say that at this point. <laughs> the number of episodes in a season doesn't seem to track with it whatever country. It Feels you're in. that way. Isn't that the way that uh, think... Shit's Creek was? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, they were. But I don't think Broken Lizard are Canadian. I'm pretty sure they're American. Really? I don't actually know. I'm not going to look it up right now. It might screw up my internet connection. I don't want to do that. (laughs) All right. So I won't call it a recommendation. Okay. But I'll say it exists. I had no idea it existed. Right. Yeah. Until this person recommended it to me. So I will recommend it to you with the caveats that I I put out there. If that sounds like something you might be interested in. Knock yourself Both of us were slightly tepid on the seasons of TV that we watched this week. I think the funniest part of it is that these people have so much time because they're in Tacoma, Washington, and it rains ah, all the time. So, it does like, that. it's always a lot of the times they'll be in the the, the the station house, and you could just hear it raining outside. Well, it's like, not as though fire departments only deal with fires, but whatever. It's a TV show. I'll they all, they, uh, they almost never are at a fire. Like it's not a it's fire. Like the last, they show, it's the last it's thing like, that fire departments do is deal with fires. They're out there. <laughs> Out there making house calls, helping people falling down, stuff like that. Every car accident, they're the first ones there. They are there. Yes. They are there. All right. So, uh, well, I guess this is the let's get the start podcast yeah, started. Yeah. So, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us a question at avrant.com. Mm-hmm. Go to our website, find our episodes along with our show notes, which have uh, links to our Flickr albums. So, you can follow along with uh, whatever pictures we may be talking about. Mm-hmm. Layouts, plans, speakers, or whatever. Sometimes Rob will show up. Th- I don't know what you show up there, to be honest. <laughs> could be anything. He could just be, it, it could be nothing but pictures of Rob's face. That just is doing like weird. There's plenty enough of that to go around on the YouTube video already, so it's certainly not that. No. <laughs> could be. It's could usually, be. it's most often, you know, if somebody sent us in a picture of their room or a diagram that we're referencing, then that'll definitely be there. And then uh, other times it'll be uh, like products that we're recommending or something like that. If we want to point out the the back panel of an AV receiver or some such, then yeah. it's handy to do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the Flickr, Flickr albums for that, uh, facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, youtube.com slash AV Rant, where you can watch our live recording sessions and rob will put those pictures at least some of them yep. up there as well so you'll be able to see them there. and we're both in video uh, form these days we don't know how much longer because there might be another flood taking this theater out but for the time being no no, no. there's no chance this the house is going to flood during the storm <laughs> oh, God. there is literally don't zero chance. That i'm you wasting talk. my time uh sandbagging the stupid garage believe me don't. This, i mean i'll be surprised if the water makes it halfway up the driveway uh-huh. that's how how much of a non-issue i think this thing's going to be I will report back to you next week to see yes. tell you how wrong I was ah. or how right I was. Yep. But I'm I, you I, put I'm, that I'm, evil being, on me, Ricky I am Bobby. <laughs> definitely being a little bit more optimistic on this one than right. I have been in the past. Uh, you contact us directly, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at well, not Twitter. His social medias are if at I'm first on reflect. a social media, my handle will be first reflect. Yeah. And I am Tom at avrant.com, and I'm not on social media because nobody will have me anymore. I'm there too edgy. Is. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you of They're all like, the people. We have reached our limit of middle-aged white men, <laughs> and they said oh, that you oh, are, sure. you did not make the cut. Sure, you, you were too, <laughs> you were too late. <laughs> and they said, "I'm sorry, sir. We've got enough of you. Uh, we're looking for some more diversity on here." And I'm like, "Fair enough, mm, fair enough. Mm. I am awfully middle-aged and awfully white." <laughs> I thank our listeners of the week to yes. become a listener of the week. Support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and going to our PayPal donation site where you can, from your own PayPal or from a credit card, uh, give us money. And that can be done either once or uh, recurring. That's which right. I don't know that anybody's taken advantage of that second yeah, one yet, but yeah. I wouldn't know if they have to be. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't know works. how that shows up. So I don't know how yeah. it does either. So far, has never said anything that made me think that somebody had done it. <laughs> so if you have done it, let me know. Ah, yeah. So that I can m- specifically mention you as the first right. person. And you Even will if forever you're not, be just the, the first to be known. <laughs> first to be known by me is good enough because it's all about me. So I want to thank Toke and Jonathan for doing that. So, Toke and Jonathan, thank you very much for leaving us a PayPal donation. Yeah, Toke and Jonathan, thank you very much for your PayPal donations. We certainly appreciate your financial support. 
if you want to support us uh, monthly and you don't want to use PayPal to do it mm-hmm. or you didn't know that it worked that way, just like me, because mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't know it worked that way, you can go to patreon.com slash podcast and sign up there to be a monthly uh, supporter of the podcast. We have 133, 133 patrons currently, and we thank each and every one of you. That is for sure. Patreon.com slash podcast. if you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation through Patreon. So big, big thank you to our 133 patrons over there. If you can't support us financially, we understand. Uh, we do not judge or blame you. Rob judges you, but mm. he's Canadian. You know how they are. So, uh, <laughs> sure, the whole nation, <laughs> the whole nation, just looking down their nose at us from up there in the whatever <laughs> place they are, the mountains. Yeah, that's that's how space. I heard works. somebody say that uh, other than like Toronto and Vancouver, mm. the ent- all of Can- Canada gives uh, gives off a midwestern vibe. I was like, ah. Eh. That might be true. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I've not met, met that many Canadians, to be honest with you. I mean, a lot of the Maritimes is, like, more British than the British. So... <laughs> yeah. How... Anyways, that's, they're definitely judging you. Uh, so if you can't support us financially, uh, just do something and let us know what it is if uh, we don't automatically know, and we will mention you here. So Aaron found some more Canadian-only movie codes mm-hmm. for Rob to test out. So Rob's been testing. Hey, it is a service we provide that's for right. free. Yep. It's a free service. <laughs> we will test out your movie codes I mean, I, for I can you. report back they all worked except one. So <laughs> There you go. See? And Aaron was it's upset about it, too. Service. I let him know. And he's like, they should all work. And I'm like, dude, th- this is definitely not worth the effort on either of our parts to go chasing it down. So <laughs> thank you, Aaron, though. I do appreciate yes. it. All right. We got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going through, mm. I guess, the ongoing disaster that is our climate that Whatever's is ruining next. my life currently. Yeah. <laughs> currently. <laughs> Uh, from Jay, who appreciated our advice about how to deal with the Loon Vision and his projection screen material that has creases in it. Communication with the Loon Vision is slow. Mm-hmm. Well, the Canadians, so you know. Yeah. Uh, so the situation has not yet been resolved, but it'll keep us informed of this of the outcome. Uh, we got a uh, gratitude from Chris, Scott, James, Martin, David, Gideon in South Africa. Yeah. And I think that may be a first that we've heard of. I mean, I definitely made the mention because I don't. Well, South Africa. Didn't we have one other person from South Africa at some point many years ago? Uh, is this the country or the region of the I, that? Continent? I don't know. It, it, he <laughs> just mentioned he's in South Africa, and that I don't. I don't know the specifics. I would imagine that's actually the country. But yes, one well, of our anyways. less less frequently mentioned, not as common notes of of being outside of where we live in North America. That's for sure. So. I put we, got it another, in there. we got a note from Paul. Uh, Rob mentioned Pearl Smith last week for their unusual TV stands. Universal totally agrees. <laughs> universal and unusual. <laughs> they're not particularly unusual, but they are universal. Yes, they're they're made of PVC pipe mm. and dowels. Uh, he totally agrees. His grandson's got a 43 inch Roku TV for Christmas, but he needed a stand with a smaller footprint since the TV comes with plastic feet that attach to the outside mm-hmm. edges, which is dumb. It's common, <laughs> though. To be honest with you, I hate it. I hate it when they're like yeah. that. It's dumb. But it is common. Uh, he, was pleasantly, he was pleasantly surprised how sturdy and nice Pearl Smith stands are for under 50 bucks. Yeah. So there you go. Yep. Uh, Aaron and Bradford. So let's go through those names again. Okay. Jay, Chris, Scott, James, Martin, David, Gideon, Paul, Aaron, and Bradford. Thank you for thanking us. Yep. I'll say the names one more time. So they came from my lips. Jay, Chris, Scott, James, Martin, David, Gideon, Paul, Aaron, and Bradford. Thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They're certainly appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. C okay in the news. CES 2024 is underway, but we record early in the week, so more news will have uh, will have been announced by the time you're hearing this. Mm-hmm. We'll cover the interesting products that and news that hasn't happened yet for us. That's right. Next week. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're we're, we're behind. Week. You know, if you're hearing we're this on behind. a Thursday or Friday or something, and other podcasts and other things than that are like getting all the latest CES news, we're a bit behind because we're recording this on mm. a Tuesday morning. So only only what is available as of now. That's the way time works. It's a crazy thing. That's how it goes. That's, it doesn't matter how early it is, though. There's plenty of an early announcements made. So let's That's run right. through some of them. Yeah. LG got an uh, early jump on things by announcing their 2024 QNED. LCD TV lineup. The QNED 99T is their 8K offering with mini LED backlighting and just two screen sizes, uh, 75 and 86 mm-hmm. inches. The QNED 9DT, 
not 99, 90. It's our 4K mini LED series. It gets four HDMI 2.1 inputs this year instead of just two. And every feature that can have the letters AI in front of it does. Yep. So, <laughs> just <laughs> slap an A on it on everything. Is there a picture setting? It's AI picture. Is there a sound AI setting? Picture. AI sound. <laughs> 65, 75, and 86 inch sizes will be available. 86 is better than 85 by (laughs) a lot. QNED 85T drops down to regular LED backlighting, but uh, still with local dimming and four HDMI 2.1 inputs. The series will include LG's first 98 inch LCD offering, and the smallest size is 50 inches. Yep. Uh, QNED 80T is a basic 60 hertz only series that gets as small as 43 inches for your bathroom. (laughs) <laughs> so, I mean, the weird thing here is when LG first introduced the QNED series, uh, which QNED originally stood for some other display technology, but LG went ahead and co-opted that and claimed it for their own and <laughs> turned it, because, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Samsung has QLED, right? QLED, quantum LED. So uh, LG decided to grab QNED ahead of everybody else and turn that into a marketing thing. But when they first introduced it, because they had what? They had their nano cell LCD TVs, um, and they had some other series as well. I think a more basic series that that didn't have a name or something like that. But then QNED was like when they started introducing mini LED backlights. That was sort of how you knew what you were getting because you had the nano cell TVs that had local dimming, but then you had the QNED TVs that had mini LED backlights. But now they're just like, nah, who cares? You know, like the, the top ones have mini LEDs, but then QNED 85 TVs, just regular LED backlights. Yeah. How that's any different from the nano cell series, I have no idea. Maybe it's the alpha processor that they put in there is like a higher spec than the nano cell because they still have the nano cell series. So I don't know what the panel difference is at this point. I can't really see that there is any. And then QNED 80 is like this really basic. I don't know if it has local dimming at all. It's 60 hertz, just regular LED backlights. I'm like, why is that part of the QNED series? So yeah. anyway, that's what they've done. Those are the ones they announced. There is an article over AV Gadgets that basically mm-hmm. Rob wrote, I think, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> I think I'm, I, I thanked him at the end, but I think really it's mostly from him that kind of goes through this whole thing, right. including okay. how LG has co-opted the QNED yes. name. Yeah. Uh, and that was this was written like well because originally Q Ned was like is the, a technology well yeah it was like the nano uh, nano rod blue mm-hmm. emitter tech technology where like instead of using a blue OLED or a blue LED to activate the quantum dots it was like these nano rods that could emit blue light on their own it was, it was entirely different uh, uh, type of emissive uh, display technology but yeah the, i haven't we haven't seen any more of that nano rod technology i don't know what happened to that it doesn't seem to be around at this point so <laughs> they just killed it by stealing they it. took the name um, and away it went <laughs> so lg announced their 2024 updates to their oled tv offerings yeah. they claim to be a bit brighter than last year but honestly the, there are very few changes from 2023 mm-hmm. the b4 series gets four hmi 2.1 inputs instead of just two the C4 series claims to get a little bit brighter than the C3, but does not get micro lens arrays. Yeah, so, so that is fully confirmed at this point. If we, we, you know, that was one of the things we wanted to see announced at CES because, of course, we got the micro lens array in the G3 series mm-hmm. for the very first time in 2023. And um, yeah, it was like, okay, might that come to the less expensive C4 series in 2024? That is definitely not happening. There was mention from LG representatives directly, though, that they do intend. Uh, eventually micro lens array panels are all they are going to make. Uh, yeah. w- once all of the factories that they have are uh, equipped with that, then eventually that that will be the only W OLED panels that they make will have micro lens array. So it's coming eventually, but just not this year. All right. The G4 series gets a second generation of micro lens array layer mm-hmm. now with even more micro lenses. Yes. And a new geometry that, along with a new algorithm, allows it to boost small highlights, 3% test pattern window or smaller to as much as 3,000 nits, which is only achievable if you don't calibrate it. That's right. That's with the uh, the the native color temperature, which is yeah. up around 10,000 Kelvin instead of 6,500 Kelvin. And uh, yeah. without, you know, bringing any of the uh, white balance or grayscale into alignment or anything like that, just maxing out as much light as they the little subpixels can possibly do, they, uh, they can right. get it up to about 3,000 nits. And Vincent Tio confirmed that with measurements of his own. It's like, yep, they really did it. It's not at all an accurate color image, but it can actually 
produce that much light out of a 3% or 2% test pattern windows. So there it is. It did get that much brighter. And uh, yeah, second generation MLA panels, they didn't just completely sit on their laurels and do exactly what they did in 2023. They made some adjustments as they went along from what they've learned from the first generation. But that is the G4 series. All right. The 83 inch G4 also gets yeah. MLA this year. That might be the biggest news from LG. Yep. Though I think that there's other news that has come out since then. There's other news. Be but it was, you know, the 55, 65, and 77 inches were the only screen sizes that had micro lens array uh, with using the W OLED panels from LG last year. So now the 80, the 83 inch, we were that was another piece of news. We were definitely waiting to see confirmed or denied by LG directly. And so, yeah, the 83 inch G4 does get micro lens array. That leaves the 97 inch the largest size as uh, the only screen size in the uh, G series that doesn't have micro lens array at this point. Okay. Uh, bu- bu- bu. The M4 series with LG Zero Connect box really is just a G4 series, but wireless now goes down to 65 inches. Yep. So there you go. So yeah, that's 65 and 77 and 83 in the M4 series also have micro lens array. Exactly the same. There is no 55 inch like there is in the G4 series in the M4 series, but uh, M4 is 65, 77, 83 all get micro lens array. There is a 97 inch. It does not have micro lens array. But yeah, just take the G4 series, remove all of the inputs, put them in a separate box that communicates wirelessly, and that's the M4 series. All right. So those were all pre-CES announced, but LG saved a little something for the show uh, show floor itself. Mm-hmm. The brand new OLED Signature T-Series was shown and announced as the first uh, consumer transparent OLED TV offering. Mm-hmm. Transparent OLED displays have been available for commercial purposes, but the T-Series should be available for purchase in the latter half of 2024. So you can see through it. You can. You can and see then- through it. Seems like a really good idea. You can see what is behind your television. Somebody w- walks into it. <laughs> Suddenly, <laughs> it isn't it's not that. Secret. I mean, it translucent is actually the better way It'd to say be it. More, more accurate. It, yeah, yeah it, it definitely, uh, like if you put your hand behind the OLED TV when it is not on or when it is on but showing something, you know, see-through, um, then your hand, you know, behind the screen looking at it from the front will definitely be a lot darker than if there was right. literally nothing there. So it is a, like a smoky translucent screen, but you can see what is on the other side of your television right through the screen the electronics and speakers are housed in in a base along the bottom it uses the same zero connect box as the m4 series to offload all the inputs to a separate location Mm -hmm. that base also houses a black film that can roll up behind the transparent oled screen to turn it into a regular oled tv with perfect black levels a new version of web os shows information along the bottom strip of the screen that is always opaque because of the base that houses everything being behind it yeah uh, it's very much a lifestyle product, sort of like the roll-up R series aimed at people who don't want to see big black rectangle on their wall when the TV is off. When it is on, even when the black film is rolled up behind the transparent TV, the uh, transparent screen, the T-series is not as bright as other LG OLEDs. It can't have a micro lens array layer because of the whole transparent thing. Yes, because of being transparent. Uh, yeah, you, well, I mean, if they did introduce a micro lens array layer at some point, it would drastically distort everything that you're yes. seeing through the screen because those little micro lenses do alter the way the light comes through that's what lenses do so uh yeah uh, i i like people are poo-pooing this all over the place because like why do i want to see through screen but i'm like i kind of get the whole appeal of there are people who are like you know what i wouldn't say no to a big because this is like 77 inch uh i'm not sure if there's an 83 inch version but they definitely were showing a 77 inch version and there are plenty of people who like I'm not willing to have a 77 inch TV in my living room or above my fireplace or whatever, because I just don't like the way it looks when it's off, which is the, actually the majority of the time, right? The majority of the time your TV is off and I don't like the way this gigantic black rectangle dominates the visuals of this room. Now it can be see-through and I'm like that there is, I, Ooh, that was some weather event or something going on. (laughs) We had a big old flashing going on if you weren't watching the YouTube version. So we'll see how much longer this uh, communication connection lasts. There's nothing going on outside. I can see the sun. (laughs) What is happening? (laughs) Hey, if you're wondering how I am still recording and streaming right now. Yeah. It just Uh, didn't get. uh, That's what battery backups were. It is before the because I have battery backups on yep. my computers yep. on, in my home theater, and I happen to be plugged in. Oh goodness! Uh, this is not good. This is yeah. This is a portent of 
not great things for the rest oh of this episode. God. But the the my router and modem are also on the battery oh backup. Oh goodness! And that is how we are maintaining yep. this right there. Oh, oh boy! God. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll. There is nothing going on outside, Rob. We'll muddle along for however long we can. I, I, they must utilities must be doing work in preparation to try and get the electrical grid ready for going. what's coming or something rather. Anyway, back to the transparent OLED. I'll just say I actually do. I, yeah. I don't think this is a ridiculous thing to offer. Uh, I, in many ways, I think this makes more sense than the roll up and roll down OLED, um, which you know was so available for like a hundred thousand dollars. This one, where like, they didn't announce a price for the T series, but you know, I'm I'm expecting it will be expensive. It'll be more expensive than the M4 oh, series, yeah. but I don't think it'll be as expensive as the R series, as the roll up OLED. I think yeah. it'll be because it's it's not. I think it's going to be more like durable too. Well, because I mean, one, what, I would think. what they did is it's it's the same OLED panel as they have in like the B4. It just doesn't yeah. have the back plane, and and yeah. and then they do have this roll up and roll down black film. That's going to add some cost, but not as much as like the entire flexible OLED panel that they have to put in the R series. It's not anywhere near that. This is a very simple little black film screen that rolls up and rolls down behind uh, behind the transparent yeah. panel. So I mean, honestly, when this comes out, if it turns out to be less expensive than what a lot of people are fearing and anticipating it wouldn't shock me because i it's not that different don't worry a reddit's gonna have a a a bot that every time you mention the thing they're gonna talk about how it's crap (laughs) 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 so you're thinking well like first of all you know so this is what rob is describing you you see your hand behind it but it's not like yeah, you know, it's not like a window. It's like right? it's it's smoky. It's like a like a like a smoky window. Yeah. So what you can do is put it in front of a painted wall you sure and could. it's not going to be as noticeable as yeah. if it as if there was just a black box there. You yeah, know, people, you know, you won't be able to put a painting behind it or put something else behind sure, yeah, it's not and have it show through. Absolutely clear. Yeah. Yeah, not, they're not there yet. Maybe they will get there. I don't know. But like it but definitely is... isn't the opaque gigantic black rectangle yes it is, I think it is I, I, not th- or you could put a mirror behind it uh and that would that would work fairly well like it you know yeah. it, the mirror would look cloudy and it would look smoky but that could work fairly well putting a mirror behind mm-hmm. it and the way that they had it they had it installed inside of like just like uh like a wire shelves and then when they had it all transparent in that, but not showing like a, a movie or a TV signal, they had it showing like uh, a, like an aquarium, a virtual aquarium. And it actually looked very convincing uh, and very three-dimensional because you could see through the screen to the wall like you could through an aquarium, but then it sure. has these virtual fish swimming around in there. And I was like, you know, there's, there's definitely ways that you can build this in and have it have it really not look like a traditional television in your room. So personally, I'm I'm happier and more in favor of it than I think a lot of the reactions that I've seen. Yeah, uh, everybody likes to poo-poo everything. So yeah. whatever. All right, Samsung, let's talk about them. Mm-hmm. Samsung had a bunch of TVs to announce as well, of course, mm-hmm. uh, on the QD OLED and OLED TV front, excuse me. They've announced three series three series different series for 2024 <laughs> the s85 d series uses lg's display uh, lg's w oled panels yeah. it's aimed at a slightly undercutting uh lg c4 series on price while adding the smaller 48 and 42 inch sizes for the first time yeah so i mean basically just take lg's technology put a samsung badge on there take dolby vision away and that's the s85 d series <laughs> <laughs> and the price savings from not having to pay for the, right, yeah. the, the the dolby they pass along that's to you that's about it <laughs> the s90d will play the uh the same game as last year's s90c series mm-hmm. uh holding over the second generation of qd oled panels at first and likely transitioning to the third generation panels later in the year samsung display the manufacturing arm of samsung claims the third generation qd oled panels are capable of getting as bright as 3000 nits on the three percent window but that's for the raw panels. Actual consumer displays won't likely get that bright. Um, and just like last year, there's an 83-inch S90D, but, uh, but that uses LG's displays, W OLED panels. Mm-hmm. The QD OLEDs remain stuck at 55, 65, and 77-inch sizes only this year. That's right. There you go. The S90D. 
S5D gets a new distinction from the S90D series. Just like last year, it'll have the newest third generation QD OLED panels right from the start. And it will have Samsung's One Connect box. But it gets a matte screen finish this year yeah. that they've dubbed OLED Glare Free, which is a very noticeable, which is very noticeable uh, in well lit rooms, but also has a drawback of making all images look a bit flatter. It's an interesting trade off that Samsung has decided to make. So there you go. For all you people complaining about, about how OLEDs can't be used in bright rooms, which is not true, you can now buy this one and have a worse pin picture, but. <laughs> claim that it's somehow better yeah so i mean like the thing is with with oleds with qd oleds as well um they they tend to be the type of screen where it is very glossy it is mirror like and it is like a sharp you know very dark because the the background is black but a a sharp reflection that you see so they've got an example of a conventional qd oled one of their own uh on the left in the demonstration that they had set up and they had these like virtual windows that were set up in the room those weren't actual windows to the outside of course because it's inside of a convention center but they had these these brightly lit windows on the left and right and you can see like a very clear reflection of that window in the conventional oled and that is absolutely the way it looks it's like yep you can see a reflection like a dark mirror exactly that on the right side which is the brand new s95d it's like you can see a rectangle of light it's not as though this is yes. some sort of vanta black that just absorbs all stray light or something <laughs> like that there is a you know glare from that light that appears on the screen but you you can't even really make out that it's a window particularly it's just a, right. a blob of rectangular ish you know light that's coming from a very similar window so that's the the matte screen finish it's actually quite similar to what's on there the frame televisions from Samsung with that that matte finish. So they've decided to just make the Quantum Dot OLEDs, their flagship S95D series, have that finish this year, um, which I, I think is an interesting way to distinguish between the S90D because the S90D, like in the 77-inch size last year, it had the the second generation panel, whether you got the 77 inch of the S90D or the S95D, the performance at the 77 inch size was identical across those two series. And it was really just a matter of whether you wanted to have the inputs built into the chassis of the TV itself or have the separate one connect box. That was about the only actual difference at the 77 inch size. At the 55 and 65 at the beginning of the year, the S90D or S90C rather, sorry, in 2023, was a little bit dimmer and, and didn't perform quite as well as the S95C series last year because the S95C got the second generation panels right away and the S90C was still using the first generation panels. So that's sort of playing along later in the year, the 55 and 65 S90D will have the same third generation panels as the S95D, but there's going to be a difference between 90D and 95D all year long because of this glossy screen versus matte screen. So um, yeah, now you can really make the choice based on that. It's a, a very obvious difference. All right. Uh, and I did write an article about OLEDs and bright rooms that you mm -hmm. can check out and then talk about. Of course, not to be outdone by LG's transparent OLED, Samsung showed off their transparent micro LED displays, which, thanks to the minuscule size of micro LEDs, are actually more transparent and easier to completely see through than LG's T-series OLEDs. Uh-oh, it's on. Except uh -oh. for the whole not actually sure this is going to be an actual product and when it comes to purchasing micro led tvs not the transparent ones yet which might not even exist this year but the uh the ones you can actually go and purchase uh they are you know what is it well i mean it's like a hundred and something thousand dollars for the <laughs> like what 110 inch size which is a, a bigger size than you can get in a regular oled of course but still uh you know order of magnitude more expensive yeah. so uh yeah don't actually expect to go out and buy a transparent micro led uh display from samsung but it's just they got the prototype they've shown it's something that definitely can be done there will be commercial applications of this without question uh and it is yeah it's very see-through it, it, yeah. it, it that, looks that like glass one, they yeah, actually that, put stuff behind it so you can right. see through it and read it. Yep. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Again, all these pictures are on our Flickr album. Yep. And will be uh, on the YouTube video if you want to watch along. That's right. Uh, moving to TCL. TCL sticking with mini LED backlit LCD TVs, and they're clearly going for big and bright. Yep. The QM851G. Sorry. 851G series claims over 5,000 local dimming zones and up to 5,000 nit peaks. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the QM75, 751G. Jeez, I'm used to two numbers. And I know, looking yeah. for the third one there. Sorry. Uh, 7, 751G series looks uh, to once again be the top bang for buck TV offering there with 1,300 zones of mini LED local dimming and 2,000 net peaks. Mm-hmm. TCL will have more uh, 98 inch models than ever with basically every series going up to that size now. <laughs> But then the TCL picked out, pulled out the literal big guns. They're 115 inch, 20,000 local yeah. zimming zones, 5,000 nit monster was exclusive to China last year, but now they're bringing it to North America as a QM 891G straight com- uh, version of the price in China last year had it costing around 12 grand. But TCL has announced, has indicated that. Uh, the North American QM 891G version will be priced at just under twenty thousand dollars MSRP because it costs a lot to ship it. Oh yeah, um, this yeah, <laughs> this is not simple uh, to bring over there. <laughs> also, though, I mean TCL famously right, like they'll announce a TV is coming out. Uh, they had the ninety eight inches that was like you know ten thousand dollars MSRP, and that was the MSRP. But then like relatively quickly you were able to buy it for five thousand dollars so uh yeah the the idea that it's going to stay at you know nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents i i think it'll drop down to fifteen thousand relatively quickly uh just based on the way tcl always does things with their prices so um, honestly if you're looking at a jvc projector that's exactly it <laughs> that's just that is not a, or, even the 20 grand is not an unreasonable price or one of the 4k sony projectors also so they're they're also right up there in that price range. Yeah. So yeah, th- this is not wildly out of line whatsoever. You for going over a hundred and fifteen inch size, and I guarantee you, the Sony projectors, the JVC projectors, they're not hitting five thousand nits. No, that's for darn sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, if you want to have a one hundred fifteen inch flat screen in a well lit room, not in any sort of dedicated theater with light control situation, there there's every justification for paying fifteen to twenty grand. You know, to to get that. That level of performance, full stop, without anything close to that level of brightness in a in a projector, close close to the same. I'm I, I, this is a very reasonable price for this, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Or the projectors are unreasonable. You can decide which one is I true. Don't, I don't really think they are yeah. for what you're getting. So, so. you know, we'll see. Will yeah. these come down in price? Like yep. Rob said, yes. I I mean, there TVs are. TVs defy all logic when it comes to pricing. <laughs> like everything else gets more expensive and Seems TVs are like, like... <laughs> we just come down in price. That's all we do. We, I mean, I can't, I, I don't know how it's possible. I don't I understand the economics of TVs when, you know, and I work in the bicycle industry and I, you know, I've dealt with a lot of other industries. Yep. Prices don't go down. They Not like this. go up. Well, like I look know. at the 98 inches, right? They're just dropping and dropping and dropping. It, it's nuts. It's I, they can't be making any money. <laughs> I uh, they must be. Uh, anyways. Anyway, Sony. Let's talk about Sony. Sony is not showing TVs at CES this year, but they held a pre-CES press event where it became clear that they don't really intend to introduce any new OLED TV models for 2024 since yeah. their flagship 2023 A95L QD OLEDs didn't come out until October yep. of last year. That's just rolling. That's basically 2024. That's so right. Just, that's what that Carrying is. Carrying over. So Sony- Sony's focus was on their newest mini LED local dimming tech, and their stated goal is to bring their LCD TV performance as close to their own dual LCD HX3110 mm-hmm. mastering monitor, which can go up to 4,000 nits full screen as possible. So they, that's what they, they're trying to do with their TVs. Yeah. Uh, their new mini LED backlights are an, evol- are an evolution of their master backlight uh, drive that includes many more local di- dimming zones than last year, but also more gradations to each local dimming zone, which gets close to making the mini LED backlight look at like a low resolution black and white version of the image all on its own. I don't really know what that means. Well, so in their mastering monitor, which is only 30 inches in size and costs right, over $30,000, because it, it's like that is a mastering monitor. It has you're to be, supposed to have your nose on it when you're yeah, doing it. That's and it why. Has to be completely <laughs> accurate. So, you know, yes. the, and obviously not making anywhere near the numbers of it. It's not mass produced. Um, but with that one, they actually have like literally two LCD layers, one of which acts as just a black and white layer, but at full resolution, and then a color layer in front. So you have 
have what is essentially pixel for pixel local dimming in the form of an entire LCD layer that just does black and white on the dual LCD. So they're saying, okay, obviously we can't have that sort of system and that type of price for our consumer Sony televisions, but what they're trying to do is make that local dimming backlight act like a low resolution version, you know, something like, you know, one eighth or one sixteenth the resolution uh, of the panel, but have that that uh, mini LED backlight just, you know, illuminate things in uh, I don't know exactly what bit depth gradation it would equate to, but like a lot of the local dimming that we have on televisions, the, some of them are pretty much only on or off. <laughs> They're almost binary. And then many of them have like four steps or eight steps or something like that. These ones, I don't know exactly how many steps Sony didn't say uh, get into that much detail, but it's just like, it's almost like full gradation, you know, low resolution version mm. of that second layer. So that it just, it just makes it look that much closer to OLED, but considerably brighter than OLED can get. Even with these new claims of like on a 3% window, you can get up to 3000 nits without having calibrated the color. This is getting to like 2500 nits fully calibrated color on these mini LED LCDs. So that's the advantage that they're going for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, bu- 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 getting away from TV's, TV news for a bit, Samsung announced their music frame wireless. I did see this. Yeah. Uh, they still need a power cord. These are art speakers. Yeah. They're the size of an LP, like a like a record, vinyl. a vinyl yeah. record. Yeah. And you can choose from a selection of curated art or upload your own artwork to have printed on its acoustically transparent front cover. There are two tweeters, two mid-range drivers, and two woofers. It can be used on its own via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but also connect via Samsung's Q-Symphony to act as surround speakers for your Samsung TV or soundbar, which is actually, I, I do like this. I, I like think, them. yeah. I think that this is, and people are like, oh, it's on the dedicated speaker. Shut up. It's a pretty dedicated Shut speaker. <laughs> Shut up. You know, this is, you know, like, oh, it's meant to work with the soundbar. It must be crap. Shut up. Anything that gets people to put speakers in their room yeah. in the right position is good. Well, like I don't having, care how they sound. Having one of these speakers mounted on each side wall is definitely much more, you know, fits in with the room. It is purely just decoration at that point. So I like them. I got no problem with that at all. So lastly for this week, Apple has, tr- has uh, as always, has tried to steal some attention away from CES. So they made it official that the Apple Vision Pro headset, and the crowd goes mild, will launch on February 2nd with pre-orders starting at uh, starting January 19th. The price is 35 It's actually $34.99. Sure. Technically. Yes. $3,500. Yeah. For a VR headset. Pretty much. When you used to have to buy a computer to run your Oculus, <laughs> it didn't cost $3,500. Well, it definitely could have, yeah. If you got a high-end gaming could PC, have. that you can easily blow past that. Yeah, but you didn't have to. <laughs> uh, if you wear glasses, though, this is a feature, not a... This is a feature. <laughs> you need to pay another $150 for the prescription lenses inserts that you order online due to the ski goggles designs and tight fit of the headset. Wearing your normal glasses isn't a viable option. You could, of course, wear contact lenses if you're a schlub. <laughs> or if you know want this headset to be something that anyone else in the house could wear because for thirty five for thirty five hundred dollars you buy one for every family member would you course. stupid this Absolutely. is how apple works i'm pretty sure there's only going to be one user account that you can load onto the thing just like <laughs> everything else that apple makes so you know why would you want to be able to switch between users on a shared device oh my god i tried to i tried to download uh itunes to my computer or my mm-hmm. phone or whatever just so that i could start accessing my music again because it's all on my um my mac i've actually copied the okay the the all, all the the music to a drive that i yep. was going to connect anyways it was like we've sent a, we've sent a uh, uh, another uh, a notification to your apple device which is my mm. macintosh my mm. old macintosh laptop um and I'm like, man, I don't think that's been powered on in like five years. What are you talking about? They're like, well, if you don't want to do that, then we'll have to, you, you can change your device, but you'll, it'll take 24 hours. I'm yep. like, Jesus Christ, you guys suck. <laughs> Comments from our listener. Scott felt, felt compelled to mention that he's had three different family members who bought three different Hisense TVs. And unfortunately, within 18 months, within 18 months, all of them had malfunctions that caused them to call Hisense's customer service. In Scott's words, Hisense's agents were rude and unhelpful, and none of his family members were able to get any sort of replacement or repair. After the one-year warranty was up, the TVs were essentially treated as disposable. So in his opinion, Hisense equals buyer beware. Ah. 
So, I mean, I don't have really any personal experience. I have not owned a Hisense TV. I do like the specs. I do like the measured performance, uh, particularly of their 7 Series. You know, that battles right up against uh, TCL's current QM7 Series uh, or Q7. Uh, I think yeah, it's just Q7, yeah. but whatever. You know, th- those are very much head-to-head, and I think Hisense is bringing a lot of bang for, bang for buck in terms of features and in terms of measured performance by the reviewers that I trust. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to how they are longevity-wise, quality control-wise, customer service-wise, I don't have first-hand experience. <laughs> Right. So you can, maybe it was just a bunch of unluck, <laughs> unlucky could situations be. going on. With Scott. That is that always that's a possibility. Just the way they are. Yeah, it, yeah it, 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 but it could be that. So there you go. It's just something to, to be con, uh, a consideration. Maybe you go TCL instead. There you go. Yeah. Um, with TVs in particular, uh, there's a lot of devices that when you buy them, they're either going to work or they're going to be not working when they come out of very the box. Quickly, and if, yes. and if, yeah, it's going to happen very quickly. So. As much as I like buying online like everybody else because of the convenience and it shows up at your house, you don't have to think about it. it there is a argument to be made for buying at buying local if they have a good mm-hmm. return policy mm-hmm. and you know you're in the situation where you're like, oh, I'm gonna get it home and try it out. If it doesn't work, I put it in the box and bring it back. Mm. Um, you know, so you don't have to deal with the company basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, I. I'm not discounting what Scott's saying. Mm-hmm. I'm sure everything he's saying is true. That, that is also, I, you can find reports just like that on almost every single company that's out there other than SVS. <laughs> <laughs> other, than, other than SVS, every company has you know what? Even like they have their there. detractors. Even they're out there too. So, you know, oh, I'm that's sure. how it goes. Yeah, yeah. On a different topic, Scott works in IT and has dealt with fiber optic cables since the mid-90s. N- now, that long H- Ultra HD... Ultra high speed HDMI cables. Now that long ultra high speed HDMI cables are becoming more common and they all use fiber optics. He thought it is important to point out that fiber optic cable manufacturers all spec a different bend radius. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't easy to find on the packaging, you can call them and ask. Scott warns that even if you're running the cable through conduit, you want to make sure that there aren't any sharp bends and that if you are spooling up extra length, you want to keep the bends gentle and wide and not secure the wire tightly uh, like with zip ties for example he says he's managed to ruin a few fiber optic ca- optic cables himself in the past and that pinching them in something like a tilting tv wall mount is easy to do by accident <laughs> lastly if the actual ends of the fiber optic cables are ever exposed be sure to avoid touching them in any way even with something like a microfiber cloth the tiniest completely invisible to our eyes scratch or trace of skin oil can ruin the transmission so basically just be gentle and careful i have never seen the end of a fiber optic cable like raw Sure. Not, not, I mean, but I can I've certainly seen them, like, see in, in IT applications yeah. where they're terminating yeah. their own. Absolutely. I can see yeah, that yeah, being the yeah. case. Yeah, for sure. But like you, you and I almost will never see that. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, some questions here. Toke, to start off with. Toke, I believe, has a very long question, if I remember. Well, there's a week. fair amount to read, but I'm not sure the answer is that long. So there will right. be all right. No. <laughs> it's quite, quite, o- quite often covers a lot of our answers. Yes. I know. Right? You can't buy it. You don't need it. Stop. <laughs> Move your couch off the wall. First up, Tok just wanted to rant a bit about repairability and sustainability when it comes to audio gear. He ran across, he came across an owner of a, a XTZ 99W12 subwoofer that wasn't working anymore. They were about to throw it out, so Tok took it off his hands. I'm XTZ. I don't know what he's talking about. That's a brand. And, XTZ is a brand. I, I got it, yeah. but I don't I don't remember ever hearing of this brand before. Oh, maybe really? they're good. I okay. Know. Maybe maybe I forgot. Toke removed the DSP amplifier to examine it for any obvious damage. He knows he had a button cell battery, much like a motherboard on a PC, tested it, and it was dead. Could it be that simple? Couldn't it be, could it? It was. <laughs> a new battery on the PCB was all it took to get the subwoofer yeah. working perfectly again, but he, s- he had searched for all available documentation on this particular subwoofer model, and that button cell battery was not mentioned anywhere. It also wasn't exactly easy, easily accessible, although it was entirely possible to get to after disassembly the subs, disassembling the sub's back plate. In his opinion, things as simple as a battery or fuse ought to be men. Uh, mandated to be easily accessible and repairable. That shouldn't be a right to repair matter. It just really bothered him and he wanted to vent about it. Um, Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yes. You're right. I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, uh, it is crazy that, you know, an entire subwoofer uh, put out of commission and then 
brought back to life by something as simple as one of those button cell batteries that is kind of wild uh i yeah. mean yeah on anything that's got a you know uh a pcb type system that's going to be like you, you do like your cmos memory right or you know your very basic memory or something like that is is retained by that battery power just like it is inside the motherboard of your pc i mean that's an example too though right is the motherboard of your pc um you know like on a laptop for example it's not easy to get to and and it could be as simple as that is the thing that died or got fried and now your computer won't turn on anymore or when you bring it up it just gives you the warning on the boot screen that uh sometimes it'll be nice enough to tell you that the battery's dead but often it's just like an error code or yeah. something right it'll give you that and all it is is that little button cell battery on the motherboard of pretty much every computer so that's not a completely dissimilar situation where uh it isn't necessarily obvious but it's there it exists and sometimes that's all it takes to get the thing working again is is replacing a battery or replacing a fuse, like you say. It's crazy. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess some questions here. People continue to lust after infrasonic subwoofer extension, even though I tell you, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we seem to be one of the few sources online speaking against that particular branch of home theater after we mentioned the, uh, the comments about the famous Edge of Tomorrow Blu-ray opening actually being an error. He went looking for more evidence and found the waveform analysis that indicated the lowest that the lowest 10 hertz extension was actually encoded into the center speaker channel, not even the dedicated LFE channel. So Toka's fairly convinced that we were right about that not having been intentional. Well, why <laughs> wouldn't it be in the center channel? That's where everybody's full range speakers are. Sure. Where else would you put it? <laughs> yes. Uh, Infrasonic yeah. bass is not only important, it's also directional. That's why it needed to be yeah, in the right, center yeah, channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, getting, getting it to, up to 110 of... dB in the in the center channel that isn't supposed to go that loud. <laughs> but related to all of this is something that Rob mentioned offhand about THX not actually mandating full cinema reference volume peaks up to 115 dB all the way down to 20 hertz, and that for THX cinema a certified cinema, so it's more like 25 hertz or something. So we went searching online for for more information, but any specific numbers from THX are really hard to come by because they don't like to talk about <laughs> they it. They don't like to put out the, what they're actually specifying, yeah. He did find a specific mention from Logitech, of all places, saying that their THX certified multimedia systems much meet, must meet THX's recommend requirements of playing down to 35 hertz and up to 20 kilohertz minus 3 dB. So is that actually the same for home theaters and full-size cinemas? Is it actually only 35 hertz extension that THX certification is worried about? That is probably for the THX... Uh, Compact, the compact, yeah, computer right. Systems. They had the different levels of certification. They We've do, talked yes. about that before, yeah. and uh, you know, so there's like the the small, medium, large, or whatever the things are called. Well, they used to have the know. THX Ultra, the THX Select, the THX right. Compact. Now they've kind of gotten away from that in the current version of THX. If you go to just THX's own website right now, they talk about THX certification, but they don't really go into explaining about the classes that they used to have. Although, of course, uh, we've got like the Perlison speakers, you know, that are talking about uh, THX Dominus, um, you know, so that, that, that that was a thing not that long ago, but they yeah, don't it's really not really not that far. Yeah, they don't gone, really seem yeah. to be emphasizing the different levels anymore. But yeah, when it comes to the Logitech systems, they were definitely talking about like the computer systems, the compact, yeah. the multimedia systems, and there the requirements were lower. I mean, one of the clues is you can just look at um, THX certified subwoofers, home theater subwoofers, because there are still the THX certified home theater subwoofers. And I mean, a great yeah, example. Yeah, Monoprice of, makes a bunch of them too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Monoprice's Monolith subs are an example of that, and they have different modes right they have the thx mode and they'll talk about okay that one gives you this level of output uh minus 3 db at 20 hertz or at 25 hertz uh but then we have a you know lower extension mode that is available you flick a switch and plug a port or something to that effect and uh, now you can have deeper extension and louder and that so that's a that's a clue as to uh like i don't actually have the the exact numbers that thx specifies for their various levels but it's a clue that i mean thx definitely is not concerning themselves below 20 hertz that that is very evident by all of the thx certified products that we've ever come across there's never been any indication that they worry whatsoever about uh uh, output levels below 20 hertz but there are a lot of clues that like 25 hertz is basically what they're caring about because there are 
THX certified subwoofers, home theater subwoofers, where you put it into that mode, and it's like, yep, they've got linear extension down to 25, and then they are minus three at a minimum, very often minus six or more at 20 hertz. So it's like, yeah, that linear extension to 25 hertz seems to be what they're aiming for. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but those are the clues. The, the evidence suggests that that's what they're aiming for. Hmm. Uh, Toke has a NAD T758V3 receiver, which has seven amplifiers built in, mm -hmm. but it can process up to 11 speaker channels. It has a 5.2.4 configuration, so he needs a minimum of two channels of external amplification. A while ago, he picked up a compact Class D amp from Audiophonics that uses a Texas Instrument Amplifier chip. For some reason that neither he nor NAD's customer service can figure out, his NAD receiver and this Class D amp just don't seem to work properly together. If he plugs a line level source directly into the audiophonics amp or the output of an audio signal generator, it works perfectly fine. If he plugs his NAD receiver's pre-outs into any of the other external amps he has on hand, he's got three other amps. Mm -hmm. Those all seem to work fine. So as far as you can tell, neither his audiophonics nor his uh, amp or his, or, nor his NAD receiver are broken. Yeah. But when the two of them are plugged together... <laughs> Either no sound comes out or maybe one channel or the other for a little bit, but never together at the same time and never reliably for any length of time. It's super puzzling. Do we have any ideas? I mean, I would think it would be a voltage problem, but that would be my only, my very only guess. The thing about Class D amplification, uh. in my opinion, is that it kind of sucks. I mean, <laughs> Well, that's not entirely true. That's a much too broad generalization. <laughs> I know. The only time I've ever had problems with the amplifier, it was always a Class D amp. I and suppose. It's, but like, we've got the Dayton Class D amps that we yeah, like. We've got the Fosse all, Class D amps that we yes. like. And then we've got the, the really high-end Class D amps from ATI and Monoprice and all the rest and of them. And don't forget that almost every one of your subwoofers are powered by Class D Absolutely. amplifier. Absolutely. Those are all definitely some Class sort. D amplifiers. Yeah, I mean, they're almost all Class Ds because they're super efficient, put a ton of power, and uh, they're very... They're very very uniform in the low in in the, a small frequency range. Yeah. It's easy to make them. It's hard to get a class D amp to be linear throughout the entire frequency range, or harder, I should say. Uh, and but being, uh, yeah, uh, I would guess it was a, it'd be invariant. A, that's the that's really the thing that class D struggles with the most yeah. is being impedance invariant. Meaning, like you can connect wildly different impedance loads in terms of your speakers and and still get linear performance. That's that's where class D tends to struggle the most, and it's why the ones that that are designed to be uh, impedance invariant have a, a ton of filtering and a ton of capacitor banks in them, and it cost a whole arm and a leg to yeah. uh, to get yeah. them up to that level. You don't, you don't get that kind of performance from like the little compact, uh, you know, Fosse amps or something like that. Uh, but this is super puzzling as to exactly yeah. why this is going on with the particular Class D amp that you have and the pre-outs of your NAD receiver. Because like you say, if you're able to plug those pre-outs into other amplifiers that you have and they're working just fine, then okay, we know that the at least there's a signal coming out of those pre-outs. It's not that. Yeah. And if you're able to just plug a line level source, like the output of a CD player or whatever, you know, directly into this Class D amp and that works... Um, then figuring out exactly why, I mean, the, the, the range of voltages that, that could be required by that amplifier versus the range of voltages that are able to be output by the pre-outs of your NAD are just, they're not far enough apart. Um, yeah. The only thing I could think, because I mean, honestly, if the signal were, like, it, let's say the voltage coming out of your, out of your NAD's pre-outs is too low too low to drive this particular class D amp to its full rated power you would still hear something consistently right. it would just be a bit quiet so the only thing that makes sense to me is that the voltage coming out of the NAD is actually too great there's there's too much voltage and it is clipping that class D amplifier and there's maybe a protection circuit in the class D amp saying okay if, if the signal if the incoming signal is just too hot too much voltage it's just going to apply a, a, a clipping filter and prevent the sound from coming out which might explain why there's a little bit of sound that pops up once in a while but just doesn't come out and often enough it might be that you need to turn the trim level yeah. of your NAD way down um, because like you can't even do the calibration if you're not hearing the test tone consistently, but if right. it's a clipping filter that's cutting off that test tone signal, you need to preemptively turn the trim level of your NAD way down. So that's about the only suggestion I can give you is, is just try turning the trim level on the pre-outs uh, that are connected to this amp on your NAD. Try turning them way down. It might be that this little class D amp from Audiophonics only needs like 0.3 of a, watt, uh, of a volt to get to full rated power or something like that. It's not completely out of the question. 
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about it too, and that 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 makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. You know, that it, it could be one way or the other. I mean, I guess technically you could turn it all turn it all the way up or turn it all the way down and see if it goes one way or the other. Well, it's just be, being this. too low doesn't make any sense. No, you, you, you I should don't think hear so something either. then just too quietly uh, yes. for for it to do this kind of like okay, there's a little bit of sound, like a choppy in and out sound sometimes doesn't work. I'm like that sounds like it's just clipping. Like the signal is just mm. clipping that amp and it has a protection circuit that's like, we're not going to put this through because I'm going to blow up if I do. So it's just chopping everything off. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. So his NAD receiver has a, his DRAC Live as his room correction program. After running it, he could easily hear what sounded like a wide dip centered right around his crossover frequency of 80 hertz. If he played some sweeps to the whole system, speakers and subs working together, uh, he would hear this dip. His mm-hmm. pair of subs are diagonally across the room from one another and he and he optimizes their uniformity across the seats using uh, seating area using a mini DSP before running track. Mm-hmm. What he heard was confirmed with measurements. Yeah. Since it was clearly in the crossover region between the speakers and subs, he decided to simply flip the polarity switch on one of his subs to see if that helped at all. It basically fixed the issue and sounded and measured way better. Why does DRAC live room correction get this so wrong? You must admit, since he uses his mini dis- DSP beforehand to optimize the uniformity of two subs, they each have different phase settings. So is that throwing DRAC off when it measures supposedly drac live base control should do a better job of this mm-hmm. but since he optimizes his sub use subwoofer uniformity manually anyways and then a simple flip of this polarity on the sub seemed to do the trick would it honestly be worth worrying about drac live base control <laughs> like is his trick of flipping the polarity ruining something else in his audio system that he just hasn't noticed yet well if you haven't noticed it yet then it's not ruining anything because there is no ru- you, you can go ahead yeah. and flip polarity switches that is not going to yeah. ruin anything at all doesn't make any difference the yeah. reason you usually shouldn't even hear a difference if you flip the polarity switch right most of the time yeah no the reason this happens and it, and it could very much happen with odyssey as well is because when you're using their systems that are not direct live base control that actually attempts to achieve a smooth crossover between your uh at least your front left and right speakers and your subwoofer uh outputs uh they're just time aligning that's that's what these systems do. They just time align, right? So they play the test tone uh, out of your speakers one at a time, and they play the test tone out of your subwoofers one at a time. Now, in your case, you just have a single subwoofer pre-out that's fe- feeding your mini DSP, and it's right. going from there. But it's still just it's still just playing a test tone out of that subwoofer output, and it is just trying to time align, meaning I play this signal, and even though you are physically sitting different distances from your various speakers, I play this signal, and the sound arrives at your seat all at the same time, right? So speakers that are a little bit farther away, they actually start making the sound just a little bit earlier than the speakers that are physically closer to you. Even though it's the same sound, the speakers that are physically closer to you begin making that sound just a tiny bit later than the speakers that are farther away from you so that they all arrive at you at the same time. Now, when it tries to do that time alignment with a bass signal, it doesn't work because bass sounds, you're never getting a direct sound that made a straight line from the subwoofer to your ears. It is only ever capturing reflected sound that has bounced around the room however many times, which is why quite often, like when you do this in Odyssey, you can measure with a tape measure that your subwoofer is 10 feet away from you, but Odyssey will report back and give you a distance to your subwoofer of, you know, 28 feet or something like that. And you're like, why is it so inaccurate? Well, it's because it's just trying to time a line when it detects the sound reaching the microphone and trying to get that to, as far as the microphone is concerned all arrive at the same time from all of the speakers but that doesn't necessarily result in the best crossover between your speakers and subwoofers it can be wildly off uh which is why we're not a a super duper huge fan of doing this individual time alignment thing of every subwoofer it it just it sometimes if you're lucky it works but there's absolutely no way you can count on it working so given that it's just basing it on time alignment that's why you ended up with this result um and thankfully it's as easy as just flicking the polarity (laughs) switch and and voila you're done that's a super easy fix and you should be happy it was that easy and on your merry way you shall go and there's nothing else you need to do yeah i did write an article on av gadgets about because time aligning subwoofers is like that is what reddit that is a tenant a central tenant of the home theater sub (laughs) reddit on reddit you have to you have to time subwoofers that are properly time aligned will sound good i'm like Uh. "Mm, i don't think so Uh. i don't think that's the way that works no but they are convinced that that is the case so uh yeah that's stupid and also uh you know it's not helpful like i did it i did it and it 
it sounds good. Therefore, you should do it because it will also sound good. That is not <laughs> that is not how that is not how things yeah, work. Yeah, like it can work out sometimes. Yes, but yes. it is in no way a guarantee. You are you know, the the lack of understanding of causality and <laughs> and uh, you know uh, correlation co- yes. correlation in this country and by people in general. <laughs> Is shocking, mm-hmm. you know. I, I I can't tell you. I had a guy come into the bike shop yesterday, and I and he wanted a new tire on his mm-hmm. on his wheel. He brought me the wheel, and I hand him the wheel back. I'm like, listen, man, this wheel's not safe. You know, half the spokes are loose. He goes, oh mm-hmm. it, yeah, I know. I'm mm-hmm. like, you shouldn't be riding on this. It's not safe. He's like, oh, it runs straight, and so it's fine. I'm like, <laughs> he goes, I've been riding it a long time, and nothing's nothing bad's happened. I'm like, well, until it does. I'm like, I wouldn't ride it. But you know, this is correlation, right? He's like, sure. I, I, I wrote it yesterday, it was fine. That's Everything's right. fine until a wheel falls off. And then <laughs> it's not fine. I'm telling you, it's dangerous. You know, and these people are like, Well, I time aligned and therefore and it and it sounds good, therefore it must sound good for that you must too. Be the Most thing to people yeah. who are giving you that advice mm. don't even have room treatments in there. They don't sure. have base the base panels in their room. They don't have any any absorption whatsoever. So the fact that they're the system sounds good to them is worth <laughs> its weight and nothing because that's exactly how what it's worth. Chris, here's a hypothetical he'd like us to like to hear us ponder. Mm-hmm. Let's say you have a small room and all you want is a 5.1 surround sound set up for a casually enjoying some movies and TV with an eye towards price, but also the audio quality. Where would we say the price point uh, where a sound bar no longer makes sense? And a full AV receiver with a 5.1 speaker system becomes a better option. Perhaps another way to phrase it would be, how much would it cost to get our minimum recommended 5.1 AV receiver and speaker system? How does that compare to the maximum we recommend for a soundbar? Yeah. So I don't think you should spend very much money on a soundbar. Okay. Full stop. Yeah. I think that, I I don't think that there's a crossover region for me between soundbar Mm -hmm. And an AV system because I think an AV system, generally speaking, once it, it, there's a there's a cost creep that happens mm-hmm. immediately mm-hmm. once you get into getting speakers because it's not that hard to get speakers that sound really good, but they do cost a little bit of money. Sure, and I don't think you're really saving any money by getting cheap crappy speakers. I think <laughs> that you should just just you should just pony up for the good stuff right away because mm. you will then live with it forever. And to me, that's a cost benefit thing that like, if you're going to go cheap, get a sound bar. If you're going to okay. get a 5.1 system, just get a good one. Mm. And it, a 5.1 system doesn't I mean the subwoofer is going to cost you $500 anyways. So, I mean, for a how really nice it, one, yes. Yeah. How are you? I mean, even the cheap ones are what 350, 400? I mean, many of them. Yeah, so you're not really saving. There's no way to really get like a home theater in a box system that I'm going to be like, woo, mm. you know, about. I'd rather you just go ahead and get a good 5.1 system and then spend like $300 on a soundbar. Like I think ah. good soundbars are left and right speakers, basically. Okay. I don't want, <laughs> I don't, I think that spending extra money to get your Dolby Atmos soundbar mm. does not help you. Mm. Uh, I don't think it does you any good. So, and I don't think that getting way, because what you really want with a soundbar is louder. That's all you really want. Well, and typically clearer than your TV speakers. I mean, that's the, that's, that's what that is motivates what people to get a soundbar <laughs> at all. Is, but that's not what the problem is most of the yeah. time with the, it, it, it's, they get the, the soundbar, like, I still can't understand dialogue, but that's now it's just often. louder as I don't yep. understand dialogue. <laughs> and that's why I'm like, okay, well, you're, you're. Every one of my speaker buying guides, every mm. one of my buying guides, period, start off with, if you haven't treated your room, you're right. wasting your freaking money. <laughs> because that, that's that's all there is to it. If you're mm. not going to properly place your couch, basically pull it off the back wall and put mm-hmm. something soft behind you. If you're not going to put some acoustic treatments in it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that you have to do like a full theater treatment. No. I'm saying that do what you know that you can do and do mm-hmm. all of it before you start buying speakers. Okay. That's so my thing. I I have a, a a fairly different take than Tom, so this is going to be a potentially fun discussion because I I do myself I I have fairly strong opinions on this um, because I I see a lot of very inexpensive sound bars that get sold, yes. and they they aren't something I would recommend. Uh, I I don't 
find the value there. I don't think they sound very good at all. <laughs> and I would much rather get something like, um, you know, like the, the least expensive pair of self-powered speakers, like Dayton has some, right? Fluence has some that are really not very expensive at all. And I would much rather have a pair of those than any of the sub $300 uh, sound bars, right? And then if you're going to compare to, okay, could I get an AV receiver and a 5.1 set of speakers for, you know, under $400? I mean, essentially, the answer is no, right? Obviously, if you were willing to go shopping used and stuff like that, that's a that's a different yeah, kettle of fish. That's a but I mean, thing, you yeah. know, I, I don't think that's really what we're talking about here. Um, you know, this is more or less. Uh, I, I'm willing to definitely consider looking at accessories for less, right? For like the AV receiver, because sure. I think that's a fairly reasonable thing to do. But if we're going, you know, brand new stuff, then I'm going to say that. Because uh, one of the questions was like, what, basically, what's the minimum, you know, receiver and 5.1 speakers that we might recommend? And I have an answer for that. And it basically costs $500. Uh, that's including, you know, uh, accepting a refurbished unit from Accessories for Less <coughs> as, your, as your AV receiver to get down to that $500 price point. So uh, I'm going to start by talking about the sound bars that, that I think are worth considering. And these have a pretty big range of price for what I am willing to recommend, because it's not that I necessarily think think a sound bar in the 800 900 all the way up to 15 1600 dollar range is actually a better sound quality experience than what you get for the same amount of money in an AV receiver and 5.1 speaker system but there are definitely convenience factors that I do not dismiss wholesale uh, just because we're in that price range. So I think there's this very much a crossover region. Tom wasn't really saying that he finds there to be this crossover region between soundbars and speakers. I do. I think that everywhere between about $500 and about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars dollars um, maybe as much as $2,100 specifically when it comes to Sonos, because if you have a whole Sonos system as your whole house audio system, I can, I can sort of justify getting up as high as $2,100 with them. Uh, but that that's the whole range there. So my answer is, where does a, uh, a 5.1 speaker system sort of begin? It's going to be like at a minimum of about $500. That means, is there a soundbar below $500 that I would recommend fairly wholeheartedly? And there is one. It's, it's Vizio's M512A-H6. Fantastic, easy to remember uh, model number there. But, th but that's the one which is retail price $500 and then very easy to find for $450 and quite frequently goes on sale for $400. Right, as we're talking about this over on Amazon, it's at $421 for the Vizio uh, M512A-H6. And in my opinion you're not able to get at least like, you know, buying through a retailer, an AV receiver and 5.1 speaker system that I would say is better than that for that same amount of money. So I think that's yeah. like, that's, that's my favorite soundbar to recommend because it's not so wildly expensive that we're asking you to spend thousands of dollars, but it is a clear, very obvious, better sound system than anything that costs less uh, and can do a whole lot more. It can actually do, you know, Atmos and TTSX uh, to, to, you know, the extent that a soundbar lets you do those things. Um, then going up just, you know, a little bit in price, if you're willing to, you know, consider accessories for less for your soundbar, Polk's Magnify Max and the version of it that comes with the separate wireless surround speakers, you can get that refurbished from accessories for less for $500 and brand new, it's $900. And that system is good enough sounding and very convenient to set up that I'm like, yeah, in that $500 to $900 price range, I can I can make a justification for it because the types of 5.1 speakers that you're going to get in that same price range, I'm not necessarily going to claim that they sound a whole lot better in, in, in that price range. Uh, and then when we're getting to bigger systems, but convenience is the number one factor, Nakamichi's Shockwave uh, systems that they offer, you can get it as a single 10-inch sub. They have an 8-inch sub version, but I'm like, why bother? If we're going to start getting into this price range close to $1,000, go for the 10-inch sub. The single 10-inch sub you can get for $800 in the Nakamichi Shockwave, and the dual 10-inch subwoofer setup that they have is $1,300. Um, so, yeah, I just, I see what you're saying, yep, but at the yep. same time, once you get into this price range... Well, that's just it. This is just, where I'm I'm really seeing the crossover now, right? Well, uh, that's why I say I don't think there's a crossover, because I would never recommend any of these things. If you're going to spend this money, get the real speakers. Because, I mean, you're okay. already trying to play, speak, play speakers anyways. Like, we're at yep. this point where you're like, if there's a sound bar, and then there's surround speakers, and then there's two subs. But it's the wireless, I mean, and it's the, you know, a little bit convenience. I'm, I'm saying I can... 
I can find the use cases where I'm going to say the sound the sound quality difference is not so huge between the good sound bar at this price point versus the 5.1 speaker system at this same price point that the the sound quality difference is not so hugely in favor of the separate speakers that if it's really about the wireless convenience I can I can get behind someone choosing the sound bar in that instance uh, and then like I said Sonos if you get to like the combination of a Sonos Arc and a Sonos Sub and a pair of era 100 surrounds that's twenty one hundred dollars and i would only recommend that if you're already in the sonos ecosystem that's about it so those are the the sound bars that i would consider there there's like samsung's flagship their q990c they have a replacement q990d coming out this year that's in the 1600 to uh two thousand dollar price range and sony has a pretty nice system too with their uh hd a5000 uh sound bar combined with their sw5 subwoofer definitely go for the bigger sub if you were to ever do the sony system don't do that sw W3, it's a bit dinky, and uh, the RS5 wireless surrounds, but that's up at the same price as Sonos, $2,100. So I find it very difficult to justify those. So going back to the speaker systems that I like to look at, uh, you were saying like, if you're stopping at 5.1, I can understand that. You can get a, a Denon S660H. That's the, the, oh, the, they're onto the 670 now, but the 660H is still very much available, refurbished or even brand new. Brand new, it's 350. Refurbished, it's 270, right? So if you combine those with like the cheapest speakers that I wouldn't feel awful about someone buying, which are uh, mono prices, uh, HT35 premium 5.1 system that goes for $230. Like there, that's 270 refurbished 660H Denon and the HT35 uh, premium speakers from monoprice for $230 that's your $500 system like I say you compare that to a $500 sound bar and I'm like those speakers aren't so much wildly better <laughs> that mm -hmm. I actually think you're getting drastically better sound quality this is more a form factor type of thing and you know some upgradability and some features in that den and receiver that you might not have in the sound bar because you do at least get multi uh, multi-q odyssey multi-q you're probably not going to get any uh, room correction whatsoever in the sound bar um, but moving on to ones that I would more readily recommend like like if you go to Denon's S760H, which is 330 refurbished or $450 new, uh, even though you were talking about doing like a 5.1 setup, because it has Atmos and because it has DTSX, you can do the virtualization, right? Even if you still right. just have 5.1 physical speakers, you can do the virtualization, still have Atmos light up on the front panel, still get that object-based audio. And I think there's some value to that. And the price is about $100 more. That's what we've done there. And then if you're willing to go up to $400 refurbished, $550 brand new, you can get Denon's X1700H and that gets you Multi-Q XT, right? Uh, uh, to me, a worthwhile upgrade to the room correction. But now we're like, okay, so we've gone to somewhere in the 400 500 maybe 550 dollar range for the av receiver what are we going to combine with those speakers like one of my top choices would be one of rsl's 5.1 uh speaker systems rsl uh speakers like their cg3m that comes with my favorite $450 subwoofer by a mile, which is a Speedwoofer 10S Mark II, right? Like their 5.1 system with that subwoofer and five of the CG3 speakers, $1,000 on the nose, right? So now we're right there with like the top end Nakamichi system, the lower end, uh, if we're going into like uh, Sonos or something like that, or like right at about the same price as Samsung's flagship soundbar. And I'm like, this is where I do feel the speakers are pronounced better than any of those soundbar solutions, right? Tom's like, he would never recommend the Nakamichi because for about that same price, you could get these RSL speakers and a Denon receiver, right? For a couple hundred dollars more, you can get the prime, prime, Ele uh, prime satellite system too with a real subwoofer with it too. Oh yeah, and I mean the Speedwoofer 10S is a real sub. Oh, I'm know? not saying so, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, know, so so uh, you know, one of the other speaker systems that I very much like, Energy's Take Classics, are still out there, three hundred and fifty dollars yeah. new. I think Accessories for Less basically bought up all the remaining stock because they're the <laughs> only place right. you can get those Energy Take Classics anymore. So I think once they're gone, they're gone. But like three hundred and fifty dollars for some Energy Take Classics, maybe four hundred dollars uh, for a Denon receiver, like seven hundred and fifty dollars. That system is beating any seven hundred and fifty dollar soundbar, right? Yes. In sound quality i will i will absolutely say that and monoprice has their monolith thx satellite speaker system as well with a pretty good thx certified eight inch sub going in there and that's eight hundred dollars right so we're all in this sort of price range you know uh at the very lowest about 230 dollars for those premium speakers but i don't really think those monoprice hd35 premium speakers at 230 dollars are actually sound that much better than a sound bar uh of uh you know similar price once you add the av receiver in there so you know i'm talking speakers that are at least 350 dollars 
dollars for the Energy Take Classics, easily upwards of a thousand dollars for the RSL 5.1 system, uh, and then combining that with a four or five hundred dollar AV receiver. I think that's better than a similarly priced soundbar, but I could make the argument for a soundbar in some situations for the wireless factor, for the Sonos factor, something like that. So it's all in that range. More expensive than that, you're definitely going speakers. Less expensive than 500, you're definitely going soundbar. I can go with that. I All can right. go basically under five hundred dollars would be. But yeah. I will. I, I be, I'll be honest with you. It, for me, it'd be like under three hundred and fifty dollars. I would say soundbar. And I mean, for me, under three hundred fifty dollars, I don't even want to get one of those soundbars. I just want to get a pair of powered speakers from Fluence or something. <laughs> Which you can absolutely do. And I think that's, I've written articles about all do. that stuff. So yep. <laughs> powered, powered speakers and your your TV, just plugging them in like the cats <laughs> and stuff like that. David. David has a small room that is dedicated to being a home gym. It's 10 by 12 with a 9-foot ceiling. It's all hard, flat surfaces with some pieces of exercise equipment in there. And about the only semi-absorptive materials are the plastic mats on the floor that provide a bit of cushioning and his belly. <laughs> <laughs> probably not it's not gonna be like my belly that's for sure uh, i don't know maybe he just got the maybe the gym mostly hangs clothes <laughs> he'd like to put a pumped up speaker system in there and he wants some hard-hitting bass mm -hmm. his only source will be spotify via this iphone he'd ideally like to keep the price under a thousand dollars he already has sonos for other rooms in his house but do they have an offering that would fit what he wants what about the prime uh, svs prime wireless pro speakers for nine hundred dollars or is there something else we would recommend more highly i would recommend the subwoofer <laughs> well that's just it right yeah that's that's going to be a bit of the challenge there is, it's a is, small room though so it is a very should small be room. able it should be able to fill it up pretty well i mean i was just looking at that uh that i was just looking at the svs prime satellite system which is mm -hmm. way more than he needs in here what he really needs is just i mean i think 7.99 it's a satellite 2.1 system would crush this place but uh, then he that's still just... needs some way of getting the signal and amplification to that so yeah that's but not they... the total price <laughs> yeah that's true i guess i'm trying to think of what else he would need. yeah i mean obviously a navy receiver is overkill for the situation a little bit but, yeah uh, you know there's certainly um i guess there's the like the the little 2.1 amplifier that monoprice has right with a bluetooth in yeah that, that yeah. would that'd be just enough just enough to do things here yeah so that's that's not out of the question uh something like that the prime wireless pro wouldn't be a, a wouldn't be an awful choice at all but if you wanted to beef up the base even more it does have a dedicated subwoofer pre-out but you'd be going above the 900 hundred dollar price to add mm -hmm. a nice subwoofer to it uh and something like rsl's speedwoofer 10s is absolutely uh what i would recommend there 450 but now you're at 1350 right you've definitely blown past the thousand dollar budget um i wanted to consider what could you get in sonos because yeah i mean that is you know if, if you've got sonos yeah. in the rest of your house it is a nice convenience to also have Sonos in your gym. Uh, now, if you're going with like their standalone speakers, about the least expensive you could get here that would actually get you anything that you could make a whiff of calling bass, right? Would be like a pair of the Sonos Era 100 speakers with the Sub Mini. Now, I don't like the Sub Mini. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sonos fans. I know why they brought it out because they wanted to have some kind of offering that didn't cost $700 for the Sonos Sub. But that Sub Mini is... I'm not a fan of it. I don't think it's worth it. And so that combo of the pair of Sonos Era 100 speakers with the Sub Mini is $930. That's as inexpensive as you can get with Sonos. And I have a tough time feeling good about recommending that. I don't feel like it's the performance level that you're chasing from what you've said. If you get the pair of Era 100s, because they're fine as the speakers, in a 10 foot by 12 foot room, I'm not really worried about the output capabilities of those speakers, and you get it with the regular Sono Sub, well, now you're up to $1,300. So, I mean, now you're at the same price as getting SVS's Prime Wireless Pro speakers plus a nice subwoofer, you know, with the RSL Speedwoofer 10S. Like, you're at the exact same price, basically, maybe $50 difference there. But Sonos makes it tough. If you got the larger Era 300 speakers, with the Sonos Sub, you're up to $1,700 and you've completely blown past the budget. So there is an offering that will definitely get very loud, is less expensive than SVS's Prime Wireless Pro speakers and still has a dedicated subwoofer output that you could attach, say, the $450 Speedwoofer 10S to, and that's Klipsch's R50 uh, PM, that's for powered monitor, but their R50 speakers are 500 bucks. So for 500 bucks plus 450 for the RSL Speedwoofer 10S, you're under $1,000. You have Klipsch self-powered speakers uh, with Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi connection uh, and, and other inputs on it as well. Everything minus HDMI. Uh, you know, the, you're... you're 
staying within the budget, you're playing crazy loud if you want to, and you have a dedicated subwoofer. That might be one of my uh, you know, favorite solutions in this case would be something like that. There's also the option of going with a portable speaker, right? Sonos yeah. has their, their Move speaker, which is okay, but you're definitely not going to get the bass out of it like you would a dedicated subwoofer, not even close. But they're, they're on the Move 2 right now, but that would be well within the budget. And having just a portable Bluetooth speaker in the Sonos system that you can carry around with you could be convenient. Ultimate Ears uh, portable Bluetooth speakers, for example, the largest one, their Hyper Boom, which I think is going for $600 these days. Um, I mean, it's got the overblown, over EQ'd bass, right? It sounds very basic. Like, like if what you're talking about is, I want to put on some workout music and have some thumping bass, it delivers that, right? It's like the semi car audio type of thumping bass. But if that's right. actually what you're wanting, right? You're not talking about high fidelity music playback. You're yeah. talking about thumping bass during my workouts. I could get behind an Ultimate Ears Hyper Boom. That's the type of sound it delivers. Uh, and then there's a very inexpensive um, uh, brand called W King, their X10 portable Bluetooth speaker. Uh, this is coming highly recommended from Wirecutter these days. It's going for like 120 bucks, uh, but it's like a thing you it's got a strap you can put it over your shoulder like an old school boom box type of thing and it's got that sort of similar to the ultimators hyper boom that that sort of tipped up bassy sound to it so those are potentially options but i kind of like going with the klipsch powered monitors and then adding a nice subwoofer to it yeah i can get behind that i do mm. like the prime the prime wireless prime. if 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 yeah. i know that doesn't that's way over that's going to get way over your budget but once it does, you add a subwoofer to once it once you add a subwoofer to it but once you the convenience factor of that's going to be pretty high. I, I agree with Rob that if you go Sonos and stick with Sonos, that might be the right. way to go simply because of the convenience factor and that yeah. you're already doing it. Yeah, um, you're just going to have to pay more than your specified budget. That's simple right. as that. Uh, I did want to mention the the it, for portable speakers, the Soundcore Motion X600, which mm -hmm. is the speaker I've been using when my, my system was down. Uh, and it gets... Pretty ridiculously loud. I don't remember <laughs> how much it costs, though. I have to f do a search for the. Sure. There it is. Six, Two hundred bucks. Okay, so yeah. I mean, it's not it's not a ton of money. But the thing, and I I know we've talked about this a lot in this podcast. But the thing about portable speaker Bluetooth speakers, especially if you are in a situation like this, mm -hmm. is you can get like a lot of the performance you're looking for. With a in a in a package that isn't is it's going to have a lot of different uses than yeah, what that's right, than yeah. than something else. So yes, it would be great to have like I mean you could honestly just go like to Sam's or whatever and they have like those karaoke speakers that have I suppose, you know yeah. wireless and all this other stuff and it's not going to sound that great. It will be loud yeah. and that's <laughs> if, if if that's what you're going for. I understand especially when you're in a workout environment. Mm -hmm. Like I don't like wearing headphones when I when yeah. I work out. Um, I don't actually work out in the gym, but I don't like wearing headphones when I'm sweating. It's full stop. <laughs> uh, and I don't like the in-ear ones for long periods of time because I, they, I, they're not. I don't find them that comfortable. But uh, I understand wanting to have it, and you also have to be loud enough to be over the sound of the equipment that That's you're right. using. And uh, I don't know that the motion is going to get you there, but it does sure. have like spatial audio, and it does oh, a okay. pretty a pretty interesting job of make of if you set it up right in front of your face, basically, mm -hmm. it will convince you. Uh, as long as you stay kind of right there, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that there is some surround sound going yeah. on, which is kind of fun. Uh, and it does have a bass boost button and mm -hmm. you know, will give you that sort of thing. I don't know that it'll be enough for this space, mm -hmm. but I think that for $200, I might consider doing that just to... Just to give like, it a try. Give it a try, and then you end up with a speaker that you can use in other situations yeah. outside and some other things. It's not – I don't believe that that one is uh, uh, like waterproof and all those other things. So there's, ah, okay. there's some considerations. The Sonos there. Move and the Ultimate Ears, the Hyperboom, and that W King X10, they are all uh, uh, yeah. weatherproof, uh, waterproof. So, yeah. You'll have to look at my review to see. I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't think it is, though. It doesn't look like it is. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, the room is already built. It's in the basement. Is there anything relatively simple he could do at this point to reduce transfer of noise upstairs? Nope. 
Uh, no, not relatively simple. Uh, I mean, the the only thing you could do is look for very obvious flanking paths. Like if your if your door allows a huge amount of sound to go through it, then weather stripping yeah. the door, replacing the door with a solid core door with weather stripping, that could be um, something I that could be done. I put weather stripping on my door. Uh, it's, yeah. the, it's an air return, so I, it's not really yeah, right. advisable. But um, but if sound is literally going through the ceiling of the gym yeah. into the upstairs, there is no, there's nothing simple and inexpensive you can do at this point. It's not like you can put egg carton foam on your ceiling and make a lick of difference in terms of the noise transfer to the upstairs. Yeah. Uh, you know, acoustic treatments are for inside the room. They don't do anything to help you with what goes to the floor above you. So that would be, if it's literally sound going through the structure of your building, that's going to be a have to take down the drywall that's in there and do a soundproofing construction to address that. The about the only thing you can do is look for obvious flanking paths and block those. And just know that it's going to make so little difference as to not be noticeable. Well, I mean, Almost if it's certainly. a really big flanking path, if it's that can big, make a, it's like close the door. <laughs> okay, do yes, well, that's yeah. going to make a difference. That's right. But you know, that's not. Most of the stuff I would imagine you've already kind of thought about. Mm. You know, like closing the door, but. Uh, it, it, I think there's going to be very... I put the solid code door. We haven't really tested it yet. I'll mm. let you know when we do. So he asked, what about the acoustics inside the home gym? Could you do anything there to avoid cra uh, sounding crazy and reverberant? That you can do. And that's just yes. like treating your your uh, home theater. You're going to put acoustic panels up everywhere that you can. Basically but, that uh, you can. As thick as you can, everywhere that you can. Because we're, we're, right. we're not worried about specific reflections. We're just the overall reverberation in the yeah. room. And... Given that as a gym, maybe he's got mirrors, which is a common thing that people do in their home gym, and you don't want to put treatments over those. The ceiling. Treat the ceiling, because it's yeah. just about knocking down the reverberation times in the room. So that's going to be just the obvious place you can put it. Know that all that absorption, all that the, that insulation in your room is going to insulate You're going to retain the room. heat. The door <laughs> so is closed for the noise, and you're retaining the heat in the room. Yes, Yeah, that's true. so you put all that stuff in there, and then you close the door, and you try to seal up any flanking paths, and next thing you know, you've got yourself a little sauna. Yeah. So be aware of that. Like, my home theater gets hot. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna you're you know with the with the projector on and a bunch of people sitting in here it gets warm in here. Sure. So just be aware that you are going to be stabilizing the temperature in the room. Let's yeah. just, when it gets cold, it'll stay cold. When it gets hot, it'll stay hot. And when you add heat to it, or it will it will retain that heat in mm -hmm. the in the room. So. Uh, on a completely separate topic, do we use ChatGPT or any other AI at all to help us in the, with the podcast in some way? He's just curious. I thought that Rob was ChatGPT, to be honest with sure. you. Sure. That's pretty much how I treat Rob as ChatGPT. <laughs> I send him questions and then answers come spitting out. Oh, that's right. Um, and they might be full of lies. Who knows? Who knows? He's, <laughs> you know. I think I'm better than ChatGPT on that front, but uh, there you we'll go. We'll see. We'll, but no, we'll, we'll I don't, to, I don't we'll use do any AI on this podcast at all. I don't use any AI in my life in any way, shape, or form. Well, haven't you used, made some images for AV gadgets using AI? Yes, I guess I do. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I do use, uh, what is that? I don't have this open on here. Anyways, a stable uh, diffusion or something like that? One what, of those? No, no, one of that. It's not that one. It's a free okay. one, and it's yeah. not very good. Okay. <laughs> it's worth, I think it's Bing, actually, now that I think okay. about it. I think it might but be Bing's for the, image generator. For the podcast, no. Straight no. up, no. And it's the only reason I use it for the image generation is because Copyright. I am not great at creating. Sorry, I just got sure. the camera. Uh, I am not great at creating my own images. I'm getting better, I think. Um, I'm learning. But, um, you know, when you're doing it yourself and trying to write at the same time. That's right. Uh, and it takes a lot of time to make an image. You're just like, I just want an image. I just need one. So <laughs> that's why I do that. Uh, what time are we at here? Oh, yeah, we got at least fifteen minutes. Hopefully, a the, little bit more. We'll the wall we has do. not the, the the ceiling. I mean, the uh, the 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 sky has not fallen here yet. Right. I, it, I keep hearing stuff. I, I know, if yeah. you're watching the video, I've disappeared a couple of times, and it's because I'm looking around the corner to see whether or not <laughs> there's rain coming because I see sunlight. But honestly, that doesn't mean anything in Florida. It rains all the time when <laughs> there's no clouds anywhere. It just falls. Yep. Dev. We talked about Dev's living room system last week where he has a set of three hand-me-down Dev Tech speakers and the center is super directional and doesn't match the left and right towers in tone or in timbre at all. He followed our advice and played pink noise and sweeps as well as some uh, 
individual test tones to reach speaker one at a time. Robert strongly suspected that the tweeter in the center speaker wasn't actually working. That doesn't seem to be the case. High frequency sweeps and individual test tones all the way up to 20 kilohertz all play out of the center speaker with no obvious loss of high frequency output. They also play fine out of the tower, so all the tweeters seem to be functioning. Mm -hmm. But plain pink noise did reveal that the center speaker has a completely different sound than the towers. <laughs> it was a, it really was a stark difference in tone. So for the time being, he just decided to listen in stereo mode with the Phantom Center. I yeah. high five you if you were in the room, but you're not. <laughs> he also found that when he ran the lower frequency and bass sweeps, that's when it seemed to recreate that fatiguing sensation that he gets when watching movies. So perhaps our suspicions about there being troublesome bass wave interactions at this main seat are correct. He's going to try adding some absorption panels to the front wall behind uh, all of the speakers, as we suggested. But now that we have this new info, if we go back to his original question, which I cannot remember, mm -hmm. do we think a change of speakers might help in this setup? Or would changing his old Denon 30? 802 receiver since it doesn't have any room correction and only basic trouble and base controls uh, base tone controls actually make sense as his first upgrade it is not the receiver it's not I mean, the receiver as, nope. as much as we want to, everybody wants to blame the receiver and say <laughs> that the receiver it, you, know, can, you know my receiver I'm going to get uh, Odyssey and it's going to fix my mismatched speakers it will, it will not and it yeah. certainly won't address the directionality weird thingy. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that there's nothing wrong with the tweeter and that center speaker. But th this is a case where, yeah, if you change the speakers, I mean, maybe you start with the center speaker, uh, although it's a little bit tough to match the tone and timbre of DevTech Bipole yeah. Towers. They are a bit picky <laughs> about go what goes with them so if you if you what you actually want is a very nice seamless timbre match across your front three speakers i do think you will eventually upgrading all three of those speakers but there's little question in my mind that you could improve upon the center speaker situation right now pretty quickly uh and not necessarily all that expensively um that that is i i do think you're at the point now where you have done enough testing that you can justify spending some money on speakers here i mean it sounds like you got these speakers either for free or for very cheap so treat yourself uh, i do think we're at that stage where some new speakers definitely make sense here yeah um this is a speaker issue and yep. i agree with rob i've had bad center channels before sure um and there's really nothing you can do to to kind of fix it and i don't really know that that's yeah. what's going on here but it's certainly not going to be um odyssey or Dirac no, or no, something no. like that that's going to fix and, this problem and replacing the center with a, a different center speaker it can definitely be better than what you have right now so that is where i would start i think it's time to start looking at center speakers yeah i agree um i would just switch all three speakers to be honest with you well that might not be in the budget so yeah Henry, Henry appreciated our advice about his Paradigm Founder series speakers that all have to go below his new projection screen since the screen almost takes up the whole front wall. <laughs> Very blue, by the way, these it walls. <laughs> it's quite blue. Like <laughs> blues, clues, blue. His, the Founder 40B bookshelf speakers with their curved sides are a few inches wider than the 70 LCR, so he isn't sure he can actually lay them on their sides and still have them clear the bottom edge of the screen. But he will definitely add absorption beside and behind them either way. And he'll be adding more panels throughout the rest of the room as well. Which brings him to his question for the week. At this moment, he's using a Moran Slimline Cinema 70S receiver for processing. He has it in preamp mode with all the amplification being provided by an Anthem amplifier. The Cinema 70S only comes with Odyssey Multi-Q, not XT or XT32. He was contemplating upgrading to the Cinema 40. For one thing, that would allow him to go beyond 7 speakers max. But he also was quite... Uh, originally quite interested in the option of adding Dirac. It is an option. It is an option. I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well. However, now that he's seen the pricing and set up a bit on Dirac and listened to our comments last week, he isn't so sure. Mm -hmm. So let's say he doesn't add more speakers. Would upgrading the Cinema 70S just, uh, just for Odyssey Multi-QXC32 be worth it? Or if Dirac runs a crazy sale or drops their prices, would the change from basic Multi-Q be able to justify his receiver upgrade? If he puts more effort into acoustically treating his room instead, would it make more sense to keep, just keep the 70S? I have okay. First of all, the drag thing is don't don't buy anything. Drag. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's just be absolutely honest We're here. We're gonna get so many negative comments. I don't but care. all right, I, not that I actually disagree. I I don't care. I don't care. Don't buy anything for drag. I mean, Andrew directly compared Drac and Odyssey, sure. and and he switched from Odyssey to Drac, getting yeah. a new receiver which had Drac, and at the end he was like, "Man, I wish I still had 
see because yeah, it really right. doesn't sound that much different no. um uh, i don't think in, to his ears at least uh so the biggest difference that's going to be made here is by adding acoustic treatments yes. full stop that is going to make the biggest difference, no matter what receiver you go with. And the uh, the other biggest dis- difference would be completely changing the speaker configuration to sure. something that the Cin- Cinema 70S simply cannot do. Right. Uh, th- those would be the, the biggest changes. I would 100% focus your efforts on the acoustic treatments, keeping your Cinema 70S for the time being. In, in My recommendation to you is I would only swap out your Cinema 70S if you get to, it doesn't have the features that I want. That that's what I would decide it on. And and I'm not talking about Odyssey being one of those features. I'm talking about you really want to go to an 11 speaker setup or something. All right, 70, Cinema 70s simply cannot do that. You're going to go buy a new AV receiver in order to be able to do that. Right? It's that type of feature difference. I would not, in your case do it just for the room correction change. I don't think that's a big enough difference to justify it. Take whatever money you were going to spend on that and put it into acoustic treatments instead. That will make the better audible improvement. Yes, I a thousand percent agree. And and the reason here is as much as I love Odyssey and I want everyone to have the best Odyssey possible, (laughs) I don't, I mean, when you're going from an untreated room to a treated room, that is where the difference is made, yeah, and oh, yeah. it's made way, way and more audibly than any than going room correction from... system has to do considerably less anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I would lo- if you just said I want Odyssey Multi QXT32, and I also would like and literally anything else that sounded sane came after that. <laughs> sure. I would say I would say upgrade your receiver. You just need for me to tell you to buy it. One more thing that you not will think you might use someday, which is mm. more speakers. Okay, that is not enough. It's something that you will definitely use the day you plug it in. Sure. And I would say okay, but it just needs to be one more thing because <laughs> you do not have enough. <laughs> yeah. With for just that one, alone, nope. It's so close for me though, my man. It <laughs> is so close for me going. Yeah, you should get that. But, but I think realistically, I don't think it's ethical of me or moral of me or whatever to tell you to spend money on something that I honestly don't think is going to make enough of a difference yeah. over just spending that money on more acoustic treatments. Yep. Um, if you're like, I have a pile of money sitting around and I want to buy something. Can I buy this for the Odyssey? I'll be like, oh, okay. Sure. But that doesn't sound like the case. Here. <laughs> Brandon. Brandon's curious about us in acoustics, Sierra series upgrade kit options. They mm-hmm. suck. Don't get them. <laughs> That's a terrible advice. To just just send all your hate mail to Lee at <laughs> avrant.com. Be- the entire Sierra series has now been updated to version 2 using a sense clipple measurement system to aid with the driver and crossover designs. There are also new Sierra ELX towers and centers that use the same laminated bamboo cabinets and raw ribbon tweeters, but have the new LX woofers and EX mid-range drivers, plus a new crossover inside. So Brandon wants to know, if you have the version 1 Sierra Towers and Horizon Center with the raw ribbon tweeters already, is the $1,100 each upgrade kit to the ELX worth it? I do. I, I As somebody who knows nothing about this uh-huh. and has never heard of this upgrade kit before reading this question, mm-hmm. I will tell you it is absolutely not worth it. <laughs> that, is my, <laughs> that, is my, uh, that is my absolutely correct and unbiased opinion. Uh, the re... And, the reason here is it, it for my money, for me, uh-huh. uh, I'm betting, and I don't know you, Brandon. I don't know your system. If you have not done literally everything else to make your system sound as ah, good as right, humanly yes, possible, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. you are not going to see the benefits of this <laughs> over what you already have. You mm-hmm. already have a fantastic sounding speaker system. Yeah spending a literal boatload of money to make it sound (laughs) marginally better is not going to be audible unless you've done literally everything else to make your room and and your system Mm. sound as good as humanly possible. So I am going to say that it is not worth it and that you should not do it. And you should spend that money on room treatments because that's what you (laughs) should spend their money on. Yeah, so I mean, you know me, I'm a big Ascend fan. Uh, I have used some of Ascend's uh, speaker upgrade kits because the original bookshelf speakers that I got were the Sierra 1 NRT, which was itself 
uh, a upgrade over the Sierra One original uh, that changed it out to the NRT tweeter. Um, was the Sierra One NRT? I got those originally. Those I got before the Sierra Twos were available. And I ended up upgrading those speakers to the Sierra 2s. Uh, so I used the upgrade kits to do that. And that uh, kept the same... No, let's see here. What, uh, no, that changed the woofer and the tweeter and the crossover. So all I kept right. was the cabinets. <laughs> that completely swapped out everything of those. Um, so, and in that case, you know, I was going from a dome tweeter and a less expensive woofer to the Raul Ribbon tweeter and a more expensive woofer. And that... I felt for me personally, I was able to justify mainly because the timbre match between those and my Sierra Horizon RAL version one speakers, exactly the same center as you have. Uh, I've got three of those across the front. Um, you know, the timbre match between those and the Sierra 2 was excellent. The timbre match between them and the uh, Sierra 1 NRTs was something I, I could, in a head to head comparison, reliably pick the difference apart in terms of a slight timbre mismatch there. So, um, you know, I'm a fan here. I, I've been through, you you know, something uh, slightly similar to what you're talking about. This is the larger speakers. This is a more expensive upgrade kit. Um, but going from the Raul Towers and Horizon Center uh, with the Raul Ribbon Tweeter all there to the uh, ELX, that, the, the, the tweeter's staying the same. Uh, the cabinets are staying the same. So this is changing out the mid-range driver and the woofers. Um, they get a tiny bit louder, but that Raul Ribbon tweeter was already fairly close to its max with its existing version one uh, mid-range driver and uh, woofer. So they don't get like markedly louder. They don't get markedly more efficient. Uh, this really is about like, in those clipple measurements, like getting rid of all the tiny squiggles that you can see but not hear. Um, I kind of like that Dave is offering these speakers because for the people who only look at measurements and don't actually listen to anything, I think they love it. And why not charge them a premium to do that? Uh, but I, I struggle. I, I struggle to say that this is honestly worth it because you're not getting a a markedly noticeably different sound if if these were you know 9 db more efficient after you do right. the change i'm like okay there's a use case i can absolutely find a reason to do this uh but this is really close yeah the, the if you the... want to know what rob sounds like <laughs> he sounds like me in the last question trying to justify getting the new the receiver odyssey the odyssey upgrade yeah, yeah alone yeah. by itself this is exactly it and in yeah. and, and, we have like us as a couple, as, as a as a partnership, <laughs> couple, if you will. Jeez, Louise. We are a couple, <laughs> as mates. No thanks, sorry, Tom. No thanks. <laughs> as as mates, as they say in Australia. You, you can just say friends. <laughs> we could, <laughs> but it's so much better to see you squirm as I call us a couple. Oh lord! As us as a couple have uh. to, have come to the conclusion, I think over over time that you can get so much performance. Yeah. For a certain amount of money, and yeah. beyond that, it is just like so hard to really justify. No matter what people online tell you, yeah. you know, it's like you know, it's so easy to pay for 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 bigger numbers for the bigger yes. number. No matter what that that might mean, like lower extension or a higher output, or you know the the you know the cl the, the straighter line mm -hmm, it's so mm -hmm. easy to pay for those things and then get them in your room and go i don't really hear a difference i don't really hear anything well because i mean like you know in those clipal measurements like uh, dave puts a fair amount of uh, emphasis on the predicted in-room response yeah. uh, which clipal is really good at doing <laughs> it really is good at doing that predicted in-room response and he's like yeah i, I have a target curve that i want to hit uh it, it's a very linear target curve but with a you know a very slight gradual down slope slope um like, like is the common recommendation he's like i've got that target curve i want to hit and like yeah though that that elx tower with the raw ribbon tweeter like it hits that target and if you compare the clipple measurement for the original version one towers with the raw ribbon tweeter there's like there's a couple of little uh you know two maybe even two and a half db uh bumps or dips along that target path that doesn't quite get it's like you know what fixes that just the slightest bit of eq <laughs> it's like it's these these are not worlds apart but if if what you want is that that measurement is exactly the target like that's what the elx is giving you like i say academically for the crowd that just wants to go by the measurements i i'm kind of happy that dave offers these speakers because why the heck not you can do it and you could charge a, a slight premium for it and why not but uh yeah i really struggle to say that it's honestly worth the money i, I haven't right. done it and that's me the biggest end fan i haven't done it 
cue the people who like to come to our podcast and say, how come you guys never recommend Ascend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, geez, oh, crimey. All you guys do is, you're SVS fans, you never recommend anybody else like good like Ascend. Wait, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Indeed. All right, we'll do one more and then we'll be done. Gideon okay. in South Africa. When Apple uh, added HDR10 Plus support to their Apple TV 4K, he discovered that multiple films in his Apple movie library are actually available in HDR10 Plus, even though they were only labeled as being in regular HDR or Dolby Vision. Yep. He also has some of those same movies on Ultra HD Blu-ray, and they were e they were all either HDR10 only or in Dolby Vision with HDR10 base layer. Uh, no HDR 10 plus. So yeah. is he curious? Where did the where did the plus versions in Apple movies come <laughs> from? Did the studios make new versions that they delivered to Apple, but didn't bother to put in, uh, out again on disc? They're never going to put it out again on disc. <laughs> You're lucky you got the version you got. Discs are dead. I hate to say it, but it's true. <laughs> uh, or was Apple somehow able to create their own HDR 10 plus versions from uh, the HDR 10 or Dolby Vision versions that they already had? Knowing Apple, they could have force the studios to to put a, give them new versions with HDR10 plus but it's also possible they just shoved it into a HDR10 plus container so let's let's find out from Rob what it was uh so yeah so i mean i i have to caveat and say that i i don't know for certain uh but in the case of apple similar to apple music um when it comes to apple movies they tend to and this isn't going to be literally every piece of content on the service but they tend to get a deliverable from the studios that's um like closer to being what they call a mezzanine file or like a a a, a non finalized version right like closer to a studio mix but it hasn't been the final master just yet uh and they, they that's under that uh mastered for iTunes right in the music version they have a sort of a similar program on the video side of things which is one of the reasons why when you purchase a video through uh you know now apple what do they even call it these days it's just uh, apple tv it's all just apple tv app now because yeah. they got rid of the separate movies and tv uh yeah, subsections and all that but when you purchase a movie through apple service right like you might have bought the standard definition or the high definition version in the past and then you didn't do a darn thing you didn't pay any extra money and now you have access to the 4k version uh or now you have an atmos soundtrack available where you didn't have that before and you didn't pay anything extra or like you just said you had these ones they were in hdr10 or they were in dolby vision and all of a sudden now they're in hdr10 plus as well and part of the reason apple tends to be able to do that while some other services don't is that they do get these sort of original not exactly mezzanine files like what Kaleidoscape gets, but a sort of similar thing, a, a little bit more of a raw <laughs> file that comes from the studios and Apple is able to do their own mastering on that and offer all these various versions uh, across all of their devices. So in the case of HDR10+, Plus, there's actually a fairly automated system that does that like with Dolby Vision there is somebody actually choosing what the values are going to be scene from scene. But in HDR10+, Plus, there's a basically automated system uh, that can create that HDR10 plus version. And as far as I'm aware, that's what's going on there, right? Mm -hmm. Apple's taking the files that they already had, they're putting it through that automated system and you're ending up with an HDR10 plus version. So it's not quite as bespoke as the Dolby Vision version where there really was a human being behind making those decisions. Uh, but it is giving you dynamic metadata on a scene by scene basis, unlike the base HDR10 version. So that's my knowledge of it. Like I say, uh, definitely from you know specific piece of content, it's not literally everything that's on there, but but Apple does have that access to the sort of more raw digital file from the studios in many cases. Mm. Do we think that studios might start to favor HDR10 Plus over Dolby Vision on discs since HDR10 Plus is royalty free? That would seem like it would be a benefit to Samsung TV owners, but it might tick off LG and Sony TV <laughs> owners. What are our thoughts? Um, I mean, so... <laughs> No, <laughs> I guess. Is I don't my think thought. that's going to happen. I, 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 and I think the reason is fairly simple. It's just, you know, it doesn't really cost them that much and they have already got it for the most part, you know, so. Well, I mean, the vast <sighs> majority of Ultra HD Blue Discs are HDR 10. Yeah. Um, you know, the second largest is Dolby Vision and that still has the HDR 10 there it's not yes. like they took away hdr10 to give you dolby vision it's got hdr10 and then there's also dolby dolby vision and then a small handful have hdr10 plus and an even smaller number 
have like all three. <laughs> they have HDR10, HDR10 Plus, and Dolby Vision. There's a, a handful of discs that have that. Um, but yeah, the idea that the studios are going to start favoring HDR10 Plus over Dolby Vision, no, I I don't think that's going to happen. What what I could see happening is not doing Dolby Vision anymore. Just yeah. HDR10, that's it. It's the simplest. It's fairly universal. Like if you have an HDR display, it's going to work with HDR10, right? That that that's the long and short of it. Then a subset also works with Dolby Vision. A subset also works with HDR10 Plus. So I don't I don't think they're going to put any more effort in (laughs) i think dolby was dolby was powerful enough and convincing enough to get them to try it out on a few (laughs) discs and be like yeah maybe we'll try this dolby vision thing because dolby has that kind of clout in the industry i don't think they're going to waste a a minute on adding an hdr 10 plus version even the the automated version of it i don't think they're that's still time that's still time which means money and they're not going to do it yeah. So do we have a preference when it comes to HDR formats? I, I don't even have 4K in my theater, so. No, <laughs> Not I yet. Uh, um, but I, I, you know, what we've seen overall is uh, in when we talk about it here on the podcast, yeah. we've seen that uh, technology has gotten to the point with some of the uh, the scene by scene, frame by yep. frame uh, tone mapping that you can get on devices yeah. that. Dolby Vision, while good, is not necessarily as necessary as we kind of thought it might be. And so, it's, it's not the uh, consistent experience that Dolby wanted it to be. Yes. It's not like Dolby didn't want it to be a consistent, reliable experience, but it, realistically, it just hasn't turned out that way because not everybody implements Dolby Vision exactly the way that it should be implemented. And, and as much cloud as Dolby has, it's not like they're able to get manufacturers to rip things off the store shelves because it didn't quite meet what they I wanted Dolby Vision to turn out to be. Uh, I do have a preferred format when it comes to HDR, and it is PQ10. Uh, it is the the raw format that doesn't you don't actually get as a deliverable on anything, but has no metadata associated to it whatsoever. That's what I actually want. I just want the raw code values, and then let my display do all of the tone mapping on its own. That that would be my preferred HDR format. But the second closest to that is HDR10, uh, because many displays are able to ignore the HDR10 metadata. At which yeah. point it's a PQ10 signal, and then they do their own frame-by-frame dynamic tone mapping. That is my preferred way of handling HDR. I don't think it actually makes sense. I completely get what Dolby envisioned, why they created the whole system, the end-to-end system. They had this vision in mind for consistency and reliability, and you were going to be able to see as much of the detail in the image as you possibly could, regardless of the display. I was like... That, that is never going to work. That costs extra money. It costs extra effort. It is never going to happen. Just give the raw code values and let the displays do what they do. I think that's where we're going to end up, basically. Maybe. Uh, well, hopefully. I mean, we have HDR10, right? You can count on HDR10 being, being there. Being there, yeah. yeah. And I think what we're going to end up with is TVs just basically doing their own thing. And mm-hmm. the only people who are going to care about... Uh, or displays doing their own thing. And that's, sim- I mean, a lot of times it's because of the vastly different capabilities displays. I mean, what, yeah. what is your projector? You know, how, how much good does it do you to have a, a, a thousand nit maximum value uh, file when your projector is like, I'm, I couldn't yeah, get two, to a thousand. 200 nits. And I'm I out. couldn't get to a thousand <laughs> nits if you paid me. That's you know, right. if, if you blew my bulb up trying to get there, I, 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 I still wouldn't get there. Uh, so you're going to end up, I think that's where we're going to end up. So who do we have left, Rob? On the list, we have Bradford and we have Jack. All right. We'll get to you next, next week. week. If you want to get your question at, answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Token Jonathan for going to avrant.com, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and sending us a PayPal donation, as well as our 133 patrons over at patreon.com. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Toke. Thank you, Jonathan, for your PayPal donations. And patreon.com slash podcast is where you can go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation, if you please. And a big thanks to our 133 patrons over there. And Aaron, you're welcome for Rob testing out those codes for you. We're sorry that one didn't work. We will do what we Aaron, can to get that resolved. Please don't put any effort into trying to get this. Like, it, it, it seemed to really bother him by his email reply. I'm like, dude, uh, let it go. But thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. 
All right. We also got some notes of gratitude from Jay, Chris, Scott, James, Martin, David, Gideon, Paul, Aaron, and Bradford. Thank you for thanking us. That is right. And I'll say those names one more time. Jay, Chris, Scott, James, Martin, David, Gideon, Paul, Aaron, and Bradford. Thank you very much for those notes of gratitude and encouragement. We definitely appreciate it. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. And look at that. Tom made it all the way through to the end of this podcast. Here is the perfect example of why you need battery backup, folks. It, it <laughs> saved this podcast saved this episode. Podcast. <laughs> it's funny, too, because there's the, there's a whole bunch of people that I'm because I, I, I flicked over the Facebook for a second and there's a lot of people in my neighborhood with power out right now. There is there no rain go. coming down and it's not blowing that hard out there. So I don't know what's going on. See, I mean, Tom's lights weren't on battery backup, so they flickered. They, they flickered. could see that going on. But the the Wi-Fi connection is computer stayed stayed on just fine. That's that's that APC protection for you right there. That's right. We bought a new one, too, because our last one got fried yeah. in the... I don't know if it got fried or if it just wasn't powerful enough, but I'll tell you what, the it the printer <laughs> the printer sucks a lot of power, man. Mm. <laughs> so there you go. For A V Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.